Chapter Twenty Four of the Alhambra: A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four: Legend of Prince Almed Al Kamal, or the Pilgrim of Love, Part Two. The prince sallied forth from Seville, sought his fellow traveller the owl, who was still dozing in the hollow tree and set off for Cordova. He approached it along hanging gardens and orange and citron groves, overlooking the fair valley of the Guadalquivir. When arrived at its gates, the owl flew up to a dark hole in the wall, and the prince proceeded in quest of the palm-tree planted in days of yore by the great Abderrahman. It stood in the midst of the great court of the mosque, towering from amidst orange and cypress trees. Dervishes and fakirs were seated in groups under the cloisters of the court, and many of the faithful were performing their ablutions at the fountains before entering the mosque. At the foot of the palm-tree was a crowd listening to the words of one who appeared to be talking with great volubility. This, said the prince to himself, must be the great traveller who is to give me tidings of the unknown princess. He mingled in the crowd, but was astonished to perceive that they were all listening to a parrot, who, with his bright green coat, pragmatical eye, and consequential top-knot, had the air of a bird on excellent terms with himself. "'How is this?' said the prince to one of the bystanders that so many grave persons can be delighted with the garrulity of a chattering bird. "'You know not of whom you speak,' said the other. "'This parrot is a descendant of the famous parrot of Persia, renowned for his story-telling talent. He has all the learning of the East at the tip of his tongue, and can quote poetry as fast as he can talk. He has visited various foreign courts, where he has been considered an oracle of erudition. He has been a universal favorite also with the fair sex, who have a vast admiration for erudite parrots that can quote poetry. Enough, said the prince, I will have some private talk with this distinguished traveller. He sought a private interview, and expounded the nature of his errand. He had scarcely mentioned it when the parrot burst into a fit of dry, rickety laughter that absolutely brought tears in his eyes. Uh, "'Excuse my mirth,' said he, "'but the mere mention of love always sets me laughing.' The prince was shocked at this ill-timed merriment. "'Is not love,' said he, "'the great mystery of nature, the secret principle of life, the universal bond of sympathy?' A fig's end, cried the parrot, interrupting him. Prithee, where hast thou learnt this sentimental jargon? Trust me, love is quite out of vogue. One never hears of it in the company of wits and people of refinement. The prince sighed as he recalled the different language of his friend the dove. But this parrot, thought he, has lived about court. He affects the wit and the fine gentleman. He knows nothing of the thing called love. Unwilling to provoke any more ridicule of the sentiment which filled his heart, he now directed his inquiries to the immediate purport of his visit. Tell me, said he, most accomplished parrot, thou who hast everywhere been admitted to the most secret bowers of beauty, Hast thou, in the course of thy travels, met with the original of this portrait? The parrot took the picture in his claw, turned his head from side to side, and examined it curiously with either eye. Upon my honour, said he, a very pretty face, very pretty. But then one sees so many pretty women in one's travels that one can hardly... But hold, bless me, now I look at it again, sure enough, this is the Princess Aldegonda, 
how could I forget one that is so prodigious a favourite with me ?" "The Princess Aldegonda," echoed the prince, " and where is she to be found ?"" Softly, softly," said the parrot, " easier to be found than gained. She is the only daughter of the Christian king who reigns at Toledo, and is shut up from the world until her seventeenth birth day, on account of some prediction of those meddle some fellows the astrologers. You ll not get a sight of her ; no mortal man can see her. I was admitted to her presence to entertain her, and I assure you, on the word of a parrot who has seen the world, I have conversed with much sillier princesses in my time." " A word in confidence, my dear parrot," said the prince. " I am heir to a kingdom, and shall one day sit upon a throne. I see that you are a bird of parts, and understand the word. Help me to gain possession of this princess, and I will advance you to some distinguished post about court." " With all my heart," said the parrot, " but let it be a sinecure if possible, for we wits have a great dislike to labour." Arrangements were promptly made. The prince sallied forth from Cordova through the same gate by which he had entered, called the owl down from the hole in the wall, introduced him to his new travelling companion as a brother savant, and away they set off on their journey. They travelled much more slowly than accorded with the impatience of the prince, but the parrot was accustomed to high life, and did not like to be disturbed early in the morning. The owl, on the other hand, was for sleeping at midday, and lost a great deal of time by his long siestas. His antiquarian taste also was in the way, for he insisted on pausing and inspecting every ruin and had long legendary tales to tell about every old tower and castle in the country. The prince had supposed that he and the parrot, being both birds of learning, would delight in each other s society, but never had he been more mistaken. They were eternally bickering. The one was a wit, the other a philosopher. The parrot quoted poetry was critical on new readings and eloquent on small points of erudition. The owl treated all such knowledge as trifling, and relished nothing but metaphysics. Then the parrot would sing songs and repeat bon mots, and crack jokes upon his solemn neighbour, and laugh outrageously at his own wit all which the owl considered a grievous invasion of his dignity, and would scowl and sulk and swell, and sit silence for a whole day together. The prince heeded not the wranglings of his companions, being wrapped up in the dreams of his own fancy, and the contemplation of the portrait of the beautiful princess. In this way they journeyed through the stern passes of the Sierra Marena, across the sunburnt plains of La Mancha and Castile, and along the banks of the Golden Tagus, which winds its wizard mazes over one half of Spain and Portugal. At length they came in sight of a strong city with walls and towers built on a rocky promontory, round the foot of which the Tagus circled with brawling violence. Behold! exclaimed the owl the ancient and renowned city of Toledo, a city famous for its antiquities. Behold those venerable domes and towers, hoary with time and clothed with legendary grandeur, in which so many of my ancestors have meditated. Pish! cried the parrot, interrupting his solemn antiquarian rapture, what have we to do with antiquities and legends and your ancestors? Behold, what is more to the purpose, behold the abode of youth and beauty. Behold, at length, O prince, the abode of your long-sought princess. The prince looked in the direction indicated by the parrot, 
and beheld, in a delightful green meadow on the banks of the Tagus, a stately palace rising from amidst the bowers of a delicious garden. It was just such a place as had been described by the dove as the residence of the original of the picture. He gazed at it with a throbbing heart. Perhaps at this moment, thought he, the beautiful princess is sporting beneath those shady bowers, or pacing with delicate step those stately terraces, or reposing beneath those lofty roofs. As he looked more narrowly, he perceived that the walls of the garden were of great height, so as to defy access, while numbers of armed guards patrolled around them. The prince turned to the parrot. O oh, most accomplished of birds, said he, thou hast the gift of human speech. Hie thee to yon garden, seek the idol of my soul, and tell her that Prince Ahmed, a pilgrim of love, and guided by the stars, has arrived in quest of her on the flowery banks of the Tagus. The parrot, proud of his embassy, flew away to the garden mounted above its lofty walls, and after soaring for a time over the lawns and groves, alighted on the balcony of a pavilion that overhung the river. Here, looking in at the casement, he beheld the princess reclining on a couch, with her eyes fixed on a paper, while tears gently stole after each other down her pallid cheek. Pluming his wings for a moment, adjusting his bright green coat, and elevating his top-knot, the parrot perched himself beside her with a gallant air. Then, assuming a tenderness of tone, uh, "'Dry thy tears, most beautiful of princesses,' said he, "'I come to bring solace to thy heart.' The princess was startled on hearing a voice, but turning and seeing nothing but a little green-coated bird bobbing and bowing before her, "'Alas! what solace canst thou yield?' said she, seeing thou art but a parrot." The parrot was nettled at the question. "'I have consoled many beautiful ladies in my time,' said he, "'but let that pass. At present, I come ambassador from a royal prince. Know that Ahmed, the prince of Granada, has arrived in quest of thee, and is encamped even now on the flowery banks of the Tagus." The eyes of the beautiful princess sparkled at these words, even brighter than the diamonds in her coronet. "'O oh, sweetest of parrots!' cried she, "'joyful indeed are thy tidings for I was faint and weary and sick almost unto death, with doubt of the constancy of Ahmed. Hie thee back, and tell him that the words of his letter are engraven in my heart, and his poetry has been the food of my soul. Tell him, however, that he must prepare to prove his love by force of arms. To-morrow is my seventeenth birthday, when the king, my father, holds a great tournament. Several princes are to enter the lists, and my hand is to be the prize of the victor." The parrot again took wing, and, rustling through the groves, flew back to where the prince awaited his return. The rapture of Ahmed, on finding the original of his adored portrait, and finding her kind and true, can only be conceived by those favoured mortals who have had the good fortune to realise day-dreams and turn shadows into substance. Still there was one thing that alloyed his transport, this impending tournament. In fact, the banks of the Tagus were already glittering with arms and resounding with trumpets of the various knights who with proud retinues were prancing on towards Toledo to attend the ceremonial. The same star that had controlled the destiny of the prince had governed that of the princess, and until her seventeenth birthday she had been shut up from the world 
to guard her from the tender passion. The fame of her charms, however, had been enhanced rather than obscured by this seclusion. Several powerful princes had contended for her alliance, and her father, who was a king of wondrous shrewdness, to avoid making enemies by showing partiality, had referred them to the arbitrament of arms. Among the rival candidates were several renowned for strength and prowess. What a predicament for the unfortunate Ahmed, unprovided as he was with weapons, and unskilled in the exercises of chivalry. Luckless prince that I am, said he, to have been brought up in seclusion under the eye of a philosopher. Of what avail are algebra and philosophy in affairs of love? Alas, Ebon Bonabon, why hast thou neglected to instruct me in the management of arms? Upon this the owl broke silence, prefacing his harangue with a pious ejaculation, for he was a devout Mussulman. Allah Akbar! God is great! exclaimed he. In his hands are all secret things. He alone governs the destiny of princes. Know, O prince, that this land is full of mysteries, hidden from all but those who, like myself, can grope after knowledge in the dark. Know that in the neighboring mountains there is a cave, and in that cave there is an iron table, and on that table lies a suit of magic armor, and beside that table stands a spell-bound steed, which have been shut up there for many generations. The prince stared with wonder while the owl, blinking his huge round eyes, and erecting his horns, proceeded. Many years since I accompanied my father to these parts on a tour of his estates, and we sojourned in that cave, and thus became I acquainted with the mystery. It is a tradition in our family, which I have heard from my grandfather when I was yet a very little owlet, that this armor belonged to a Moorish magician, who took refuge in this cavern when Toledo was captured by the Christians, and died here, leaving his steed and weapons under a mystic spell, never to be used but by a Moslem, and by him only from sunrise to midday. In that interval, whoever uses them will overthrow every opponent. Enough! Let us seek this cave, exclaimed Ahmed. Guided by his legendary mentor, the prince found the cavern, which was in one of the wildest recesses of those rocky cliffs which rose around Toledo. None but the mousing eye of an owl or an antiquary could have discovered the entrance to it. A sepulchral lamp of everlasting oil shed a solemn light through the place. On an iron table in the centre of the cavern lay the magic armour, against it leaned the lance, and beside it stood an Arabian steed caparisoned for the field, but motionless as a statue. The armour was bright and unsullied, as it had gleamed in days of old, the steed in as good condition as if just from the pasture, and when Ahmed laid his hand upon his neck, he pawed the ground and gave a loud neigh of joy that shook the walls of the cavern. Thus provided with horse to ride and weapon to wear, the prince determined to defy the field at the impending tourney. The eventful morning arrived. The lists for the combat were prepared in the vega or plain just below the cliff-built walls of Toledo. Here were erected stages and galleries for the spectators, covered with rich tapestry and sheltered from the sun by silken awnings. All the beauties of the land were assembled in those galleries, while below pranced plumed knights, with their pages and esquires, among whom figured conspicuously the princes who were to contend in the tourney. 
All the beauties of the land, however, were eclipsed when the Princess Aldegonda appeared in the royal pavilion, and for the first time broke forth upon the gaze of an admiring world. A murmur of wonder ran through the crowd at her transcending loveliness, and the princes who were candidates for her hand, merely on the faith of her reported charms, now felt tenfold ardor for the conflict. The princess, however, had a troubled look. The color came and went from her cheek, and her eye wandered with a restless and unsatisfied expression over the plumed throng of knights. The trumpets were about sounding for the encounter when a herald announced the arrival of a stranger knight, and Ahmed rode into the field. The steeled helmet studded with gems rose above his turban. His cuirass was embossed with gold, his scimitar and dagger were of the workmanship of fay, and flamed with precious stones. A round shield was at his shoulder, and in his hand he bore the lance of charmed virtue. The caparison of his Arabian was richly embroidered and swept the ground, and the proud animal pranced and snuffed the air, and neighed with joy at once more beholding the array of arms. The lofty and graceful demeanor of the prince struck every eye, and when his appellation was announced, the Pilgrim of Love, a universal flutter and agitation prevailed amongst the fair dames in the galleries. When Ahmed presented himself at the lists, however, they were closed against him. None but princes, he was told, were admitted to the contest. He declared his name and rank. Still worse, he was a Moslem, and could not engage in a tourney where the hand of a Christian princess was the prize. The rival princes surrounded him with haughty and menacing aspects, and one of insolent demeanour and Herculean frame sneered at his light and youthful form, and scoffed at his amorous appellation. The ire of the prince was roused. He defied his rival to the encounter. They took distance, wheeled, and charged. At the first touch of the magic lance, the brawny scoffer was tilted from his saddle. Here the prince would have paused, but alas, he had to deal with a demoniac horse and armor. Once in action, nothing could control them. The Arabian steed charged into the thickest of the throng, the lance overturned everything that presented. The gentle prince was carried pell-mell through the field, strewing it with high and low, gentle and simple, and grieving at his own involuntary exploits. The king stormed and raged at this outrage on his subjects and his guests. He ordered out all his guards. They were unhorsed as fast as they came up. The king threw off his robes, grasped buckler and lance, and rode forth to awe the stranger with the presence of majesty itself. Alas, majesty fared no better than the vulgar. The steed and lance were no respecters of persons. To the dismay of Ahmed he was borne full tilt against the king, and in a moment the royal heels were in the air, and the crown was rolling in the dust. At this moment the sun reached the meridian. The magic spell resumed its power. The Arabian steed scoured across the plain, leaped the barrier, plunged into the Tagus, swam its raging current, bore the prince, breathless and amazed, to the cavern, and resumed his station like a statue beside the iron table. The prince dismounted right gladly, and replaced the armor, to abide the further decrees of fate. Then, seating himself in the cavern, he ruminated on the desperate state to which this bedeviled steed and armor had reduced him. 
never should he dare to show his face in Toledo after inflicting such disgrace upon its chivalry, and such an outrage on its king. What, too, would the princess think of so rude and riotous an achievement? Full of anxiety, he sent forth his winged messengers to gather tidings. The parrot resorted to all the public places and crowded resorts of the city, and soon returned with a world of gossip. All Toledo was in consternation. The princess had been borne off senseless to the palace. The tournament had ended in confusion. Every one was talking of the sudden apparition, prodigious exploits, and strange disappearance of the Moslem knight. Some pronounced him a Moorish magician. Others thought him a demon who had assumed a human shape. While others related traditions of enchanted warriors hidden in the caves of the mountains, and thought it might be one of these, who had made a sudden eruption from his den. All agreed that no mere ordinary mortal could have wrought such wonders or unhorsed such accomplished and stalwart Christian warriors. The owl flew forth at night and hovered about the dusky city, perching on the roofs and chimneys. He then wheeled his flight up to the royal palace, which stood on the rocky summit of Toledo, and went prowling about its terraces and battlements, eavesdropping at every cranny, and glaring in with his big goggling eyes at every window where there was a light, so as to throw two or three maids of honor into fits. It was not until the gray dawn began to peer above the mountains that he returned from his mousing expedition and related to the prince what he had seen. As I was prying about one of the loftiest towers of the palace, said he, I beheld through a casement a beautiful princess. She was reclining on a couch with attendants and physicians around her but she would none of their ministry and relief. When they retired, I beheld her draw forth a letter from her bosom, and read and kiss it, and give way to loud lamentations, at which, philosopher as I am, I could not but be greatly moved. The tender heart of Ahmed was distressed at these tidings, too true were thy words, O sage Ibn Bonaban, cried he. Care and sorrow and sleepless nights are the lot of lovers. Allah preserve the princess from the blighting influence of this thing called love. Further intelligence from Toledo corroborated the report of the owl. The city was a prey to uneasiness and alarm. The princess was conveyed to the highest tower of the palace, every avenue to which was strongly guarded. In the meantime, a devouring melancholy had seized upon her, of which no one could divine the cause. She refused food, and turned a deaf ear to every consolation. The most skilful physicians had essayed their art in vain. It was thought some magic spell had been practised upon her, and the king made proclamation, declaring that whoever should effect her cure should receive the richest jewel in the royal treasury. When the owl, who was dozing in a corner, heard of this proclamation, he rolled his large eyes and looked more mysterious than ever. "'Allah Akbar!' exclaimed he. Happy the man that shall effect that cure, should he but know what to choose from the royal treasury. What mean you, most reverend owl? said Ahmed. Hearken, O prince, to what I shall relate. We owls, you must know, are a learned body, and much given to dark and dusty research. During my late prowling at night about the domes and turrets of Toledo, I discovered a college of antiquarian owls who hold their meetings in a great vaulted tower where the royal treasure is deposited. 
Here they were discussing the forms and inscriptions and designs of ancient gems and jewels, and of golden and silver vessels, heaped up in the treasury, the fashion of every country and age ; but mostly they were interested about certain reliques and talismans that have remained in the treasury since the time of Roderick the Goth. Among these was a box of shittim wood, secured by bands of steel of oriental workmanship, and inscribed with mystic characters known only to the learned few. This box and its inscription had occupied the college for several sessions, and had caused much long and grave dispute. At the time of my visit, a very ancient owl, who had recently arrived from Egypt, was seated on the lid of the box, lecturing upon the inscription, and proved from it that the coffer contained the silken carpet of the throne of Solomon the Wise, which doubtless had been brought to Toledo by the Jews, who took refuge there after the downfall of Jerusalem. When the owl had concluded his antiquarian harangue, the prince remained for a time absorbed in thought. I have heard, said he, from the sage Ibn Bonaban, of the wonderful properties of that talisman, which disappeared at the fall of Jerusalem, and was supposed to be lost to mankind. Doubtless it remains a sealed mystery to the Christians of Toledo. If I can get possession of that carpet, my fortune is secure. The next day the prince laid aside his rich attire, and arrayed himself in the simple garb of an Arab of the desert. He dyed his complexion to a tawny hue, and no one could have recognized in him the splendid warrior who had caused such admiration and dismay at the tournament. With staff in hand and scrip by his side, and a small pastoral reed, he repaired to Toledo, and presenting himself at the gate of the royal palace, announced himself as a candidate for the reward offered for the cure of the princess. The guards would have driven him away with blows. "'What can a vagrant Arab like thyself pretend to do?' said they, in a case where the most learned of the land have failed. The king, however, overheard the tumult, and ordered the Arab to be brought into his presence. "'Most potent king,' said Ahmed, you behold before you a Bedouin Arab, the greater part of whose life has been passed in the solitudes of the desert. Those solitudes, it is well known, are the haunts of demons and evil spirits who beset us poor shepherds in our lonely watchings, enter into and possess our flocks and herds, and sometimes render even the patient camel furious. Against these our counter-charm is music, and we have legendary airs handed down from generation to generation, that we chant and pipe to cast forth these evil spirits. I am of a gifted line, and possess this power in its fullest force. If it be any evil influence of the kind that holds a spell over thy daughter, I pledge my head to free her from its sway. The king, who was a man of understanding, and knew the wonderful secrets possessed by the Arabs, was inspired with hope by the confident language of the prince. He conducted him immediately to the lofty tower secured by several doors, in the summit of which was the chamber of the princess. The windows opened upon a terrace with balustrades, commanding a view over Toledo and all the surrounding country. The windows were darkened, for the princess lay within, a prey to a devouring grief that refused all alleviation. The prince seated himself on the terrace, and performed several wild Arabian airs on his pastoral pipe, which he had learnt from his attendants in the Henrelief at Granada. The princess continued insensible, and the doctors who were present shook their heads 
and smiled with incredibility and contempt. At length the prince laid aside the reed, and to a simple melody chanted the amatory verses of the letter which had declared his passion. The princess recognized the strain. A fluttering joy stole to her heart. She raised her head and listened. Tears rushed to her eyes and streamed down her cheeks. Her bosom rose and fell with a tumult of emotions. She would have asked for the minstrel to be brought into her presence, but maiden coyness held her silent. The king read her wishes, and at his command Ahmed was conducted into the chamber. The lovers were discreet. They but exchanged glances, yet those glances spoke volumes. Never was triumph of music more complete. The rose had returned to the soft cheek of the princess, the freshness to her lip, and the dewy light to her languishing eye. All the physicians present stared at each other with astonishment. The king regarded the Arab minstrel with admiration, mixed with awe. "'Wonderful youth!' exclaimed he. "'Thou shalt henceforth be the first physician of my court, and no other prescription will I take but thy melody. For the present receive thy reward, the most precious jewel in my treasury.' O king, replied Ahmed, I care not for silver or gold or precious stones. One relic hast thou in thy treasury, handed down from the Moslems who once owned Toledo. A box of sandalwood containing a silken carpet. Give me that box, and I am content. All present were surprised at the moderation of the Arab, and still more when the box of sandalwood was brought and the carpet drawn forth. It was of fine green silk, covered with Hebrew and Chaldaic characters. The court physicians looked at each other, shrugged their shoulders, and smiled at the simplicity of this new practitioner, who could be content with so paltry a fee. This carpet, said the prince, once covered the throne of Solomon the wise. It is worthy of being placed beneath the feet of beauty. So saying, he spread it on the terrace beneath an ottoman that had been brought forth for the princess. Then, seating himself at her feet, Who, said he, shall counteract what is written in the book of fate? Behold, the prediction of the astrologers verified. Know, O king, that your daughter and I have long loved each other in secret. Behold in me the pilgrim of love. These words were scarcely from his lips, when the carpet rose in the air, bearing off the prince and princess. The king and the physicians gazed after it with open mouths and straining eyes, until it became a little speck on the white bosom of a cloud, and then disappeared in the blue vault of heaven. The king, in a rage, summoned his treasurer. How is this, said he, that thou hast suffered an infidel to get possession of such a talisman? Alas, sire, we knew not its nature, nor could we decipher the inscription of the box. If it be indeed the carpet of the throne of the wise Solomon, it is possessed of magic power, and can transport its owner from place to place through the air. The king assembled a mighty army, and set off for Granada in pursuit of the fugitives. His march was long and toilsome. In camping in the Vega he sent a herald to demand restitution of his daughter. The king himself came forth with all his court to meet him. In the king he beheld the Arab minstrel, for Ahmed had succeeded to the throne on the death of his father, and the beautiful Aldegonda was his sultana. The Christian king was easily pacified when he found that his daughter was suffered to continue in her faith. Not that he was particularly pious, but religion is always a point of pride and etiquette with princes. 
Instead of bloody battles there was a succession of feasts and rejoicings, after which the king returned well pleased to Toledo, and the youthful couple continued to reign as happily as wisely in the Alhambra. It is proper to add that the owl and the parrot had severally followed the prince by easy stages to Granada, the former travelling by night and stopping at the various hereditary possessions of his family, the latter figuring in the gay circles of every town and city on his route. Ahmed gratefully requited the services which they had rendered him on his pilgrimage. He appointed the owl his prime minister the parrot his master of ceremonies. It is needless to say that never was a realm more sagely administered or a court conducted with more exact punctilio. End of chapter 24, part 2「Chapter twenty five of the Alhambra, a series of tales and sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Legend of the Rose of the Alhambra, or The Page and the Gerfalcon. For some time after the surrender of Granada by the Moors, that delightful city was a frequent and favorite residence of the Spanish sovereigns until they were frightened away by successive shocks of earthquakes, which toppled down various houses and made the old Moslem towers rock to their foundation. Many, many years then rolled away, during which Granada was rarely honored by a royal guest. The palace of the nobility remained silent and shut up, and the Alhambra, like a slighted beauty, sat in mournful desolation among her neglected gardens. The tower of the Infantas, once the residence of the three beautiful Moorish princesses, partook of the general desolation, and the spider spun her web athwart the gilded vault, and bats and owls nestled in those chambers that had been graced by the presence of Zaida, Zoraida, and Zorohaida. The neglect of the tower may partly have been owing to some superstitious notions of the neighbors. It was rumored that the spirit of the youthful Zorahida, who had perished in that tower, was often seen by moonlight, seated beside the fountain in the hall, or moaning about the battlements, and that the notes of her silver lute would be heard at midnight by wayfarers passing along the glen. At length, the city of Granada was once more enlivened by the royal presence. All the world knows that Philip V was the first Bourbon that swayed the Spanish sceptre. All the world knows that he married, in second nuptials, Elizabetta or Isabella, for they are the same, the beautiful princess of Parma. And all the world knows that by this chain of contingencies a French prince and an Italian princess were seated together on the Spanish throne. For the reception of this illustrious pair, the Alhambra was repaired and fitted up with all possible expedition. The arrival of the court changed the whole aspect of the lately deserted place. The clangor of drum and trumpet, the tramp of steed about the avenues and outer court, the glitter of arms and display of banners about Barbican and battlement recalled the ancient and warlike glories of the fortress. A softer spirit, however, reigned within the royal palace. There was the rustling of robes and the cautious tread and murmuring voice of reverential courtiers about the antechambers, a loitering of pages and maids of honor about the gardens, and the sound of music stealing from open casements. Among those who attended in the train of the monarchs was a favorite page of the queen named Ruiz de Alacon. To say that he was a favorite page of the queen was at once to speak his eulogium, for every one in the suite of the stately Elizabetta was chosen for grace and beauty and accomplishments. 
He was just turned of eighteen, light and little of form, and graceful as a young Antinous. To the queen he was all deference and respect, yet he was at heart a roguish stripling, petted and spoiled by the ladies about the court, and experienced in the ways of women far beyond his years. This loitering page was one morning rambling about the groves of the Henrelief, which overlooked the grounds of the Alhambra. He had taken with him for his amusement a favorite gerfalcon of the queen. In the course of his rambles, seeing a bird rising from a thicket, he unhooded the hawk and let him fly. The falcon towered high in the air, made a swoop at his quarry, but missing it, soared away regardless of the calls of the page. The latter followed the truant bird with his eye in its capricious flight, until he saw it alight upon the battlements of a remote and lonely tower in the outer wall of the Alhambra, built on the edge of a ravine that separated the royal fortress from the grounds of the Henrelief. It was, in fact, the tower of the princesses. The page descended into the ravine and approached the tower, but it had no entrance from the glen, and its lofty height rendered any attempt to scale it fruitless. Seeking one of the gates of the fortress, therefore, he made a wide circuit to that side of the tower facing within the walls. A small garden enclosed by a trellis-work of reeds overhung with myrtle lay before the tower. Opening a wicket, the page passed between beds of flowers and thickets of roses to the door. It was closed and bolted. A crevice in the door gave him a peep into the interior. There was a small Moorish hall with fretted walls, light marble columns, and an alabaster fountain surrounded with flowers. In the center hung a gilt cage containing a singing bird. Beneath it, on a chair, lay a tortoise-shell cat among reels of silk and other articles of female labor, and a guitar, decorated with ribbons, leaned against the fountain. Ruiz de Alacon was struck with these traces of female taste and elegance in a lonely and, as he had supposed, deserted tower. They reminded him of the tales of enchanted halls, current in the Alhambra, and the tortoise-shell cat might be some spellbound princess. He knocked gently at the door, a beautiful face peeped out from a little window above, but was instantly withdrawn. He waited, expecting that the door would be opened, but he waited in vain. No footstep was to be heard within, all was silent. Had his senses deceived him, or was this beautiful apparition the fairy of the tower? He knocked again, and more loudly. After a little while, the beaming face once more peeped forth. It was that of a blooming damsel of fifteen. The page immediately doffed his plumed bonnet, and entreated in the most courteous accents to be permitted to ascend the tower in pursuit of his falcon. "'I dare not open the door, signor,' replied the little damsel, blushing. "'My aunt has forbidden it. I do beseech you, fair maid. It is the favorite falcon of the queen. I dare not return to the palace without it. Are you, then, one of the cavaliers of the court? I am, fair maid, but I shall lose the queen's favor and my place if I lose this hawk. Santa Maria, it is against you cavaliers of the court that my aunt has charged me especially to bar the door against wicked cavaliers, doubtless, but I am none of those, but a simple, harmless page, who will be ruined and undone if you deny me this small request. The heart of the little damsel was touched by the distress of the page. It was a thousand pities he should be ruined for the want of so trifling a boon. Surely, too, he could not be one of those dangerous beings whom her aunt had described as a species of cannibal, ever on the prowl, to make prey of thoughtless damsels. He was gentle and modest, and stood so entreatingly with cap in hand, and looked so charming. 
The sly page saw that the garrison began to waver, and redoubled his entreaties in such moving terms, that it was not in the nature of mortal maiden to deny him. So the blushing little warder of the tower descended and opened the door with a trembling hand. And if the page had been charmed by a mere glimpse of her countenance from the window, he was ravished by the full-length portrait now revealed to him. Her Andalusian bodice and trim basquina set off the round but delicate symmetry of her form, which was as yet scarce verging into womanhood. Her glossy hair was parted on her forehead with scrupulous exactness, and decorated with a fresh plucked rose according to the universal custom of the country. It is true her complexion was tinged by the ardor of a southern sun, but it served to give richness to the mantling bloom of her cheek, and to heighten the luster of her melting eyes. Ruiz de Alacon beheld all this with a single glance, for it became him not to tarry. He merely murmured his acknowledgments, and then bounded lightly up the spiral staircase in quest of his falcon. He soon returned with the truant bird upon his fist. The damsel, in the meantime, had seated herself by the fountain in the hall, and was winding silk. But in her agitation she let fall the reel upon the pavement. The page sprang, picked it up, then dropping gracefully on one knee, presented it to her, but seizing the hand extended to receive it, imprinted on it a kiss more fervent and devout than he had ever imprinted on the fair hand of his sovereign. "'Ave Maria, Signor!' exclaimed the damsel, blushing still deeper with confusion and surprise, for never before had she received such a salutation. The modest page made a thousand apologies, assuring her it was the way, at court, of expressing the most profound homage and respect. Her anger, if anger she felt, was easily pacified, but her agitation and embarrassment continued, and she sat blushing deeper and deeper, with her eyes cast down upon her work, entangling the silk which she attempted to wind. The cunning page saw the confusion in the opposite camp, and would fain have profited by it, but the fine speeches he would have uttered died upon his lips. His attempts at gallantry were awkward and ineffectual, and to his surprise the adroit page, who had figured with such grace and effrontery among the most knowing and experienced ladies of the court, found himself awed and abashed in the presence of a simple damsel of fifteen. In fact, the artless maiden, in her own modesty and innocence, had guardians more effectual than the bolts and bars prescribed by her vigilant aunt. Still, where is the female bosom proof against the first whisperings of love? The little damsel, with all her artlessness, instinctively comprehended all that the faltering tongue of the page failed to express, and her heart was fluttered at beholding, for the first time, a lover at her feet, and such a lover. The diffidence of the page, though genuine, was short-lived, and he was recovering his usual ease and confidence when a shrill voice was heard at a distance. "'My aunt is returning from mass,' cried the damsel in a fright. "'I pray you, signor, depart.' "'Not until you grant me that rose from your hair as a remembrance.' She hastily untwisted the rose from her raven locks. "'Take it,' cried she, agitated and blushing, "'but pray, be gone.' The page took the rose, and at the same time covered with kisses the fair hand that gave it. Then, placing the flower in his bonnet, and taking the falcon upon his fist, he bounded off through the garden, bearing away with him the heart of the gentle Jacinta. When the vigilant aunt arrived at the tower, she remarked the agitation of her niece, and an air of confusion in the hall. 
but a word of explanation sufficed. A gerfalcon had pursued his prey into the hall. Mercy on us! To think of a falcon flying into the tower! Did ever one hear of so saucy a hawk? Why, the very bird in the cage is not safe. The vigilant Fredegonda was one of the most wary of ancient spinsters. She had a becoming terror and distrust of what she denominated the opposite sex, which had gradually increased through a long life of celibacy. Not that the good lady had ever suffered from their wiles, nature having set up a safeguard in her face that forbade all trespass upon her premises. But ladies who have least cause to fear for themselves are most ready to keep a watch over their more tempting neighbors. The niece was the orphan of an officer who had fallen in the wars. She had been educated in a convent, and had recently been transferred from her sacred asylum to the immediate guardianship of her aunt, under whose overshadowing care she vegetated in obscurity like an opening rose blooming beneath a briar. Nor, indeed, is this comparison entirely accidental, for, to tell the truth, her fresh and dawning beauty had caught the public eye, even in her seclusion, and, with that poetical turn common to the people of Andalusia, the peasantry of the neighborhood had given her the appellation of the Rose of the Alhambra. The wary aunt continued to keep a faithful watch over her tempting little niece, as long as the court continued at Granada, and flattered herself that her vigilance had been successful. It is true, the good lady was now and then discomposed by the tinkling of guitars and chanting of love ditties from the moonlit groves beneath the tower, but she would exhort her niece to shut her ears against such idle minstrelsy, assuring her that it was one of the arts of the opposite sex by which simple maids were often lured to their undoing. Alas, what chance with a simple maid has a dry lecture against a moonlight serenade? At length King Philip cut short his sojourn in Granada, and suddenly departed with all his train. The vigilant Fredegonda watched the royal pageant as it issued forth from the gate of justice, and descended the great avenue leading to the city. When the last banner disappeared from her sight, she returned exulting to her tower, for all her cares were over. To her surprise, a light Arabian steed pawed the ground at the wicket gate of the garden. To her horror, she saw through the thickets of roses a youth in gaily embroidered dress at the feet of her niece. At the sound of her footsteps, he gave a tender adieu, bounded lightly over the barrier of reeds and myrtles, sprang upon his horse, and was out of sight in an instant. The tender Jacinta, in the agony of her grief, lost all thought of her aunt's displeasure. Throwing herself into her arms, she broke forth into sobs and tears. Ay, de mi, cried she, he is gone, he is gone, and I shall never see him more. Gone? Who is gone? What youth is this I saw at your feet? A queen's page, aunt, who came to bid me farewell. A queen's page, child, echoed the vigilant Fredegonda faintly, and when did you become acquainted with a queen's page? The morning that the gerfalcon flew into the tower, it was the queen's gerfalcon, and he came in pursuit of it. Ah, silly, silly girl, know that there are no gerfalcons half so dangerous as those prankling pages and it is precisely such simple birds as thee that they pounce upon. The aunt was at first indignant at learning that, in despite of her boasted vigilance, a tender intercourse had been carried on by the youthful lovers almost beneath her eye. But when she found that her simple-hearted niece, though thus exposed, 
without the protection of bolt or bar to all the machinations of the opposite sex, had come forth unsinged from the fiery ordeal, she consoled herself with the persuasion that it was owing to the chaste and cautious maxims in which she had, as it were, steeped her to the very lips. While the aunt laid this soothing unction to her pride, the niece treasured up the oft-repeated vows of fidelity of the page. But what is the love of restless roving man? A vagrant stream that dallies for a time with each flower upon its banks, then passes on and leaves them all in tears. Days, weeks, months elapsed, and nothing more was heard of the page. The pomegranate ripened, the vine yielded up its fruit, the autumnal rains descended in torrents from the mountains, the Sierra Nevada became covered with a snowy mantle, and wintry blasts howled through the halls of the Alhambra. Still he came not. The winter passed away. Again the genial spring burst forth with song and blossoms and balmy zephyr. The snows melted from the mountains, until none remained but on the lofty summit of the Nevada, glistening through the sultry summer air. Still nothing was heard of the forgetful page. In the meantime, the poor little Jacinta grew pale and thoughtful. Her former occupations and amusements were abandoned. Her silk lay entangled, her guitar unstrung, her flowers were neglected the notes of her bird unheeded, and her eyes, once so bright, were dimmed with secret weeping. If any solitude could be devised to foster the passion of a lovelorn damsel, it would be such a place as the Alhambra, where everything seems disposed to produce tender and romantic reveries. It is a very paradise for lovers. How hard, then, to be alone in such a paradise, and not merely alone, but forsaken. Alas, silly child, would the staid and immaculate Fredonda say, when she found her niece in one of her desponding moods, Did I not warn thee against the wiles and deceptions of these men? What couldst thou expect, too, from one of a haughty and aspiring family, thou, an orphan, the descendant of a fallen and impoverished line. Be assured, if the youth were true, his father, who is one of the proudest nobles about the court, would prohibit his union with one so humble and portionless as thou. Pluck up thy resolution, therefore, and drive these idle notions from thy mind. The words of the immaculate Fredegunda only served to increase the melancholy of her niece, but she sought to indulge it in private. At a late hour one summer night, after her aunt had retired to rest, she remained alone in the hall of the tower, seated beside the alabaster fountain. It was here that the faithless page had first knelt and kissed her hand. It was here that he had often vowed eternal fidelity. The poor little damsel's heart was overladen with sad and tender recollections. Her tears began to flow, and slowly fell, drop by drop, into the fountain. By degrees the crystal water became agitated, and bubble, 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 boiled up, and was tossed about, until a female figure richly clad in Moorish robes, slowly rose to view. Jacinta was so frightened that she fled from the hall and did not venture to return. The next morning she related what she had seen to her aunt, but the good lady treated it as a fantasy of her troubled mind, or supposed she had fallen asleep and dreamt beside the fountain. Thou hast been thinking of the story of the three Moorish princesses that once inhabited the tower, continued she, and it has entered into thy dreams. What story, aunt? I know nothing of it. Thou hast certainly heard of the three princesses, 
Zayda, Zoraida, and Zorahayda, who were confined in this tower by the king their father, and agreed to fly with three Christian cavaliers. The first two accomplished their escape, but the third failed in resolution, and remained, and it is said, died in this tower. I now recollect to have heard of it, said Jacinta, and to have wept over the fate of the gentle Zorahayda. Thou mayest well weep over her fate, continued the aunt, for the lover of Zorahayda was thy ancestor. He long bemoaned his Moorish love, but time cured him of his grief, and he married a Spanish lady from whom thou art descended. Jacinta ruminated upon these words that what I have seen is no fantasy of the brain, she said to herself, I am confident. If indeed it be the sprite of the gentle Zorahayda, which I have heard lingers about this tower, of what should I be afraid? I'll watch by the fountain to-night. Perhaps the visit will be repeated. Towards midnight, when everything was quiet, she again took her seat in the hall. As the bell on the distant watch-tower of the Alhambra struck the midnight hour, the fountain was again agitated, and bubble, 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 it tossed about the waters until the Moorish female again rose to view. She was young and beautiful, her dress was rich with jewels, and in her hand she held a silver lute. Jacinta trembled and was faint but was reassured by the soft and plaintive voice of the apparition, and the sweet expression of her pale melancholy countenance. Daughter of mortality, said she, what aileth thee? Why do thy tears trouble my fountain, and thy sighs and plaints disturb the quiet watches of the night? I weep because of the faithlessness of man, and I bemoan my solitary and forsaken state. Take comfort, thy sorrows may yet have an end. Thou beholdest a Moorish princess, who like thee was unhappy in her love. A Christian knight, thy ancestor, won my heart, and would have borne me to his native land, and to the bosom of his church. I was a convert in my heart, but I lacked courage equal to my faith, and lingered till too late. For this the evil genii are permitted to have power over me, and I remain enchanted in this tower until some pure Christian will deign to break the magic spell. Wilt thou undertake the task? I will, replied the damsel, trembling. Come hither, then, and fear not. Dip thy hand in the fountain, sprinkle the water over me, and baptize me after the manner of thy faith. So shall the enchantment be dispelled, and my troubled spirit have repose. The damsel advanced with faltering steps, dipped her hand in the fountain, collected water in the palm, and sprinkled it over the pale face of the phantom. The latter smiled with ineffable benignity. She dropped her silver lute at the feet of Jacinta, crossed her white arms upon her bosom, and melted from sight, so that it seemed merely as if a shower of dewdrops had fallen into the fountain. Jacinta retired from the hall, filled with awe and wonder. She scarcely closed her eyes that night, but when she awoke at daybreak, out of a troubled slumber, the whole appeared to her like a distempered dream. On descending into the hall, however, the truth of the vision was established, for beside the fountain she beheld the silver lute glittering in the morning sunshine. She hastened to her aunt, related all that had befallen her, and called her to behold the lute as a testimonial of the reality of her story. If the good lady had any lingering doubts, they were removed when Jacinta touched the instrument, for she drew forth such ravishing tones as to thaw even the frigid bosom of the immaculate Fredahonda, 
that region of eternal winter into a genial flow. Nothing but supernatural melody could have produced such an effect. The extraordinary power of the lute became every day more and more apparent. The wayfarer passing by the tower was detained and, as it were, spellbound in breathless ecstasy. The very birds gathered in the neighboring trees, and, hushing their own strains, listened in charmed silence. Rumor soon spread the news abroad. The inhabitants of Granada thronged to the Alhambra to catch a few notes of the transcendent music that floated about the tower of Las Infantas. The lovely little minstrel was at length drawn forth from her retreat. The rich and powerful of the land contended who should entertain and do honor to her, or rather, who should secure the charms of her lute to draw fashionable throngs to their salons. Wherever she went, her vigilant aunt kept a dragon-watch at her elbow, awing the throngs of impassioned admirers who hung in raptures on her strains. The report of her wonderful powers spread from city to city. Malaga, Sevilla, Cordova, all became successively mad on the theme. Nothing was talked of throughout Andalusia but the beautiful minstrel of the Alhambra. How could it be otherwise among a people so musical and gallant as the Andalusians, when the lute was magical in its powers, and the minstrel inspired by love? While all Andalusia was thus music-mad, a different mood prevailed at the court of Spain. Philip V, as is well known, was a miserable hypochondriac, and subject to all kinds of fancies. Sometimes he would keep to his bed for weeks together, groaning under imaginary complaints. At other times he would insist upon abdicating his throne, to the great annoyance of his royal spouse, who had a strong relish for the splendors of a court and the glories of a crown, and guided the sceptre of her imbecile lord with an expert and steady hand. Nothing was found to be so efficacious in dispelling the royal megrims as the powers of music. The queen took care, therefore, to have the best performers, both vocal and instrumental, at hand, and retained the famous Italian singer Farinelli about the court as a kind of royal physician. At the moment we treat of, however, a freak had come over the mind of this sapient and illustrious Bourbon, that surpassed all former vagaries. After a long spell of imaginary illness, which set all the strains of Farinelli and the consultations of a whole orchestra of court fiddlers at defiance, the monarch, fairly in idea, gave up the ghost and considered himself absolutely dead. This would have been harmless enough, and even convenient both to his queen and courtiers, had he been content to remain in the quietude befitting a dead man. But to their annoyance he insisted upon having the funeral ceremonies performed over him, and to their inexpressible perplexity began to grow impatient and to revile bitterly at them for negligence and disrespect in leaving him unburied. What was to be done? To disobey the king's positive commands was monstrous in the eyes of the obsequious courtiers of a punctilious court, but to obey him and bury him alive would be downright regicide. In the midst of this fearful dilemma, a rumor reached the court of the female minstrel who was turning the brains of all Andalusia. The queen dispatched missives in all haste to summon her to San Ildefonso, where the court at that time resided. Within a few days, as the queen with her maids of honor was walking in these stately gardens, intended with their avenues and terraces and fountains to eclipse the glories of versailles the far-famed minstrel was conducted into her presence 
the imperial elizabetta gazed with surprise at the youthful and unpretending appearance of the little being that had set the world madding she was in her picturesque andalusian dress her silver lute was in her hand and she stood with modest and downcast eyes but with a simplicity and freshness of beauty that still bespoke her the rose of the alhambra as usual she was accompanied by her ever-vigilant fredegonda who gave the whole history of her parentage and descent to the inquiring queen if the stately elizabetta had been interested by the appearance of jacinta she was still more pleased when she learnt that she was of a meritorious though impoverished line and that her father had bravely fallen in the service of the crown if thy powers equal their renown said she and thou canst cast forth this evil spirit that possesses thy sovereign thy fortune shall henceforth be my care and honours and wealth attend thee impatient to make trial of her skill she led the way at once to the apartment of the moody monarch jacinta followed with downcast eyes through files of guards and crowds of courtiers they arrived at length at a great chamber hung in black the windows were closed to exclude the light of day a number of yellow wax tapers in silver sconces diffused a lugubrious light and dimly revealed the figures of mutes in mourning dresses and courtiers who glided about with noiseless step and woe-begone visage on the midst of a funeral bed or bier his hands folded on his breast and the tip of his nose just visible lay extended this would-be buried monarch the queen entered the chamber in silence and pointing to a footstool in an obscure corner beckoned to jacinta to sit down and commence at first she touched her lute with a faltering hand but gathering confidence and animation as she proceeded drew forth such soft aerial harmony that all present could scarcely believe it mortal as to the monarch who had already considered himself in the world of spirits he set it down for some angelic melody or the music of the spheres by degrees the theme was varied and the voice of the minstrel accompanied the instrument she poured forth one of the legendary ballads treating of the ancient glories of the alhambra and the achievements of the moors her whole soul entered into the theme for with the recollections of the alhambra was associated the story of her love the funereal chamber resounded with the animating strain it entered into the gloomy heart of the monarch he raised his head and gazed around he sat up on his couch his eyes began to kindle at length leaping upon the floor he called for sword and buckler the triumph of music or rather of the enchanted lute was complete the demon of melancholy was cast forth and as it were a dead man brought to life the windows of the apartment were thrown open the glorious effulgence of spanish sunshine burst into the late lugubrious chamber all eyes sought the lovely enchantress but the lute had fallen from her hand she had sunk upon the earth and the next moment was clasped to the bosom of ruiz de alacon the nuptials of the happy couple were shortly after celebrated with great splendour but hold i hear the reader ask how did ruiz de alacon account for his long neglect oh that was all owing to the opposition of a proud pragmatical old father besides young people who really like one another soon come to an amicable understanding and bury all past grievances whenever they meet but how was the proud pragmatical old father reconciled to the match oh his scruples were easily overruled by a word or two from the queen especially as dignities and rewards were showered upon the blooming favourite of royalty 
Besides, the lute of Jacinta, you know, possessed a magic power, and could control the most stubborn head and hardest heart. And what became of the enchanted lute? Oh, that is the most curious matter of all, and plainly proves the truth of all the story. That lute remained for some time in the family, but was purloined and carried off, as was supposed by the great singer Farinelli, in pure jealousy. At his death it passed into other hands in Italy, who were ignorant of its mystic powers, and, melting down the silver, transferred the strings to an old Cremona fiddle. The strings still retain something of their magic virtues. A word in the reader's ear, but let it go no further. That fiddle is now bewitching the whole world. It is the fiddle of Paganini. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Alhambra, A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 The Veteran Among the curious acquaintances I made in my rambles about the fortress was a brave and battered old colonel of invalids, who was nestled like a hawk in one of the Moorish towers. His history, which he was fond of telling, was a tissue of those adventures, mishaps, and vicissitudes that render the life of almost every Spaniard of note as varied and whimsical as the pages of Gil Blas. He was in America at twelve years of age, and reckoned among the most signal and fortunate events of his life his having seen General Washington. Since then he had taken a part in all the wars of his country. He could speak experimentally of most of the prisons and dungeons of the peninsula, had been lamed of one leg, crippled in his hands, and so cut up and carbonadoed that he was a kind of walking monument of the troubles of Spain, on which there was a scar for every battle and broil, as every year of captivity was notched upon the tree of Robinson Crusoe. The greatest misfortune of the brave old cavalier, however, appeared to have been his having commanded at Malaga during a time of peril and confusion, and been made a general by the inhabitants to protect them from the invasion of the French. This had entailed upon him a number of just claims upon government that I feared would employ him until his dying day in writing and printing petitions and memorials to the great disquiet of his mind, exhaustion of his purse, and penance of his friends, not one of whom could visit him without having to listen to a mortal document of half an hour in length, and to carry away half a dozen pamphlets in his pocket. This, however, is the case throughout Spain. Everywhere you meet with some worthy white brooding in a corner, and nursing up some pet grievance and cherished wrong. Besides, a Spaniard who has a lawsuit or a claim upon government may be considered as furnished with employment for the remainder of his life. I visited the veteran in his quarters in the upper part of the Torre del Vino, or Wine Tower. His room was small, but snug, and commanded a beautiful view of the Vega. It was arranged with a soldier's precision three muskets and a brace of pistols, all bright and shining, were suspended against the wall, with a sabre and a cane hanging side by side, and above them two cocked hats, one for parade and one for ordinary use. A small shelf containing some half-dozen books formed his library, one of which, a little old mouldy volume of philosophical maxims, was his favorite reading. This he thumbed and pondered over day by day, applying every maxim to his own particular case, provided it had a little tinge of wholesome bitterness, and treated of the injustice of the world. Yet he was social and kind-hearted, 
and provided he could be diverted from his wrongs and his philosophy, was an entertaining companion. I like these old weather-beaten sons of fortune, and enjoy their rough campaigning anecdotes. In the course of my visits to the one in question, I learnt some curious facts about an old military commander of the fortress, who seems to have resembled him in some respects, and to have had similar fortunes in the wars. These particulars have been augmented by inquiries among some of the old inhabitants of the place, particularly the father of Mateo Jimenez, of whose traditional stories the worthy I am about to introduce to the reader was a favorite hero. End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of the alhambra a series of tales and sketches of the moors and spaniards by washington irving this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven the governor and the notary in former times there ruled as governor of the alhambra a doughty old cavalier who from having lost one arm in the wars was commonly known by the name of el Hobernardo manco or the one-armed governor. He, in fact, prided himself upon being an old soldier, wore his moustaches curled up to his eyes, a pair of campaigning boots, and a Toledo as long as a spit, with his pocket-handkerchief in the basket-hilt. He was, moreover, exceedingly proud and punctilious, and tenacious of all his privileges and dignities. Under his sway, the immunities of the Alhambra, as a royal residence and domain, were rigidly exacted. No one was permitted to enter the fortress with firearms, or even with a sword or staff, unless he were of a certain rank, and every horseman was obliged to dismount at the gate and lead his horse by the bridle. Now, as the hill of the Alhambra rises from the very midst of the city of Granada, being, as it were, an excrescence of the capital, it must at all times be somewhat irksome to the captain-general who commands the province to have thus an imperium in imperio, a petty independent post in the very centre of his domains. It was rendered the more galling, in the present instance, from the irritable jealousy of the old governor that took fire on the least question of authority and jurisdiction and from the loose vagrant character of the people who had gradually nestled themselves within the fortress as in a sanctuary and thence carried on a system of roguery and depredation at the expense of the honest inhabitants of the city thus there was a perpetual feud and heart-burning between the captain-general and the governor the more virulent on the part of the latter inasmuch as the smallest of two neighboring potentates is always the most captious about his dignity. The stately palace of the captain-general stood in the Plaza Nueva, immediately at the foot of the hill of the Alhambra, and here was always a bustle and parade of guards and domestics and city functionaries. A beetling bastion of the fortress overlooked the palace and public square in front of it, and on this bastion the old governor would occasionally strut backwards and forwards with his Toledo girded by his side, keeping a wary eye down upon his rival, like a hawk reconnoitring his quarry from his nest in a dry tree. Whenever he descended into the city it was in grand parade, on horseback, surrounded by his guards, or in his state coach an ancient and unwieldy Spanish edifice of carved timber and gilt leather, drawn by eight mules, with running footmen, outriders, and lackeys, on which occasions he flattered himself he impressed every beholder with awe and admiration as vice-garant of the king, though the wits of Granada, particularly those who loitered about the palace of the captain-general, were apt to sneer at his petty parade, and in allusion to the vagrant character of his subjects, to greet him with the appellation of the King of the Beggars. 
one of the most fruitful sources of dispute between these two doughty rivals, was the right claimed by the governor to have all things passed free of duty through the city, that were intended for the use of himself or his garrison. By degrees this privilege had given rise to extensive smuggling. A nest of contrabandistas took up their abode in the hovels of the fortress, and the numerous caves in its vicinity, and drove a thriving business under the connivance of the soldiers of the garrison. The vigilance of the captain-general was aroused. He consulted his legal adviser and factotum, a shrewd meddlesome escribano, or notary, who rejoiced in an opportunity of perplexing the old potentate of the Alhambra, and involving him in a maze of legal subtleties. He advised the captain-general to insist upon the right of examining every convoy passing through the gates of his city, and penned a long letter for him in vindication of the right. Governor Manco was a straightforward cut-and-thrust old soldier, who hated an escribano worse than the devil, and this one in particular worse than all other escribanos. What, said he, curling up his moustaches fiercely, does the captain-general set this man of the pen to practice confusions upon me? I'll let him see an old soldier is not to be baffled by schoolcraft. He seized his pen and scrawled a short letter in a crabbed hand, in which, without deigning to enter into argument, he insisted on the right of transit free of search, and denounced vengeance on any custom-house officer who should lay his unhallowed hand on any convoy protected by the flag of the Alhambra. While this question was agitated between the two pragmatical potentates, it so happened that a mule laden with supplies for the fortress arrived one day at the gate of Hinil, by which it was to traverse a suburb of the city on its way to the Alhambra. The convoy was headed by a testy old corporal, who had long served under the governor, and was a man after his own heart, as rusty and staunch as an old Toledo blade. As they approached the gate of the city, the corporal placed the banner of the Alhambra on the pack-saddle of the mule, and drawing himself up to a perfect perpendicular, advanced with his head dressed to the front, but with the wary side-glance of a cur passing through hostile ground, and ready for a snap and a snarl. "'Who goes there?' said the sentinel at the gate. "'Soldier of the Alhambra!' said the corporal, without turning his head. "'What have you in charge?' "'Provisions for the garrison.' "'Proceed.' The corporal marched straight forward, followed by the convoy, but had not advanced many paces before a posse of custom-house officers rushed out of a small toll-house. "'Hello there!' cried the leader. "'Muleteer, halt, and open those packages!' The corporal wheeled round and drew himself up in battle array. "'Respect the flag of the Alhambra!' said he. These things are for the governor. A figo for the governor, and a figo for his flag, muleteer. Halt, I say. Stop the convoy at your peril, cried the corporal, cocking his musket. The muleteer gave his beast a hearty thwack. The custom-house officer sprang forward and seized the halter, whereupon the corporal leveled his piece and shot him dead. The street was immediately in an uproar. The old corporal was seized, and, after undergoing sundry kicks and cuffs and cudgelings, which are generally given impromptu by the mob in Spain as a foretaste of the after-penalties of the law, he was loaded with irons and conducted to the city prison, while his comrades were permitted to proceed with the convoy, after it had been well rummaged, to the Alhambra. The old governor was in a towering passion when he heard of this insult to his flag and capture of his corporal. For a time he stormed about the Moorish halls, and vapoured about the bastions, and looked down fire and sword upon the palace of the captain-general. 
having vented the first ebullition of his wrath he dispatched a message demanding the surrender of the corporal as to him alone belonged the right of sitting in judgment on the offences of those under his command the captain-general aided by the pen of the delighted escribano replied at great length arguing that as the offence had been committed within the walls of his city and against one of his civil officers it was clearly within his proper jurisdiction the governor rejoined by a repetition of his demand the captain-general gave a sir rejoinder of still greater length and legal acumen the governor became hotter and more peremptory in his demands and the captain-general cooler and more copious in his replies until the old lion-hearted soldier absolutely roared with fury at being thus entangled in the meshes of legal controversy while the subtle escribano was thus amusing himself at the expense of the governor he was conducting the trial of the corporal who mewed up in a narrow dungeon of the prison had merely a small grated window at which to show his iron-bound visage and receive the consolations of his friends a mountain of written testimony was diligently heaped up according to spanish form by the indefatigable escribano the corporal was completely overwhelmed by it he was convicted of murder and sentenced to be hanged it was in vain the governor sent down remonstrance and menace from the alhambra the fatal day was at hand and the corporal was put in capilla that is to say in the chapel of the prison as is always done with culprits the day before execution that they may meditate on their approaching end and repent them of their sins seeing things drawing to extremity the old governor determined to attend to the affair in person. For this purpose he ordered out his carriage of state, and, surrounded by his guards, rumbled down the avenue of the Alhambra into the city. Driving to the house of the Escribano, he summoned him to the portal. The eye of the old governor gleamed like a coal at beholding the smirking man of the law advancing with an air of exultation what is this i hear cried he that you are about to put to death one of my soldiers all according to law all in strict form of justice said the self-sufficient escribano chuckling and rubbing his hands i can show your excellency the written testimony in the case fetch it hither said the governor the escribano bustled into his office delighted with having another opportunity of displaying his ingenuity at the expense of the hard-headed veteran he returned with a satchel full of papers and began to read a long deposition with professional volubility by this time a crowd had collected listening with outstretched necks and gaping mouths prithee man get into the carriage out of this pestilent throng that i may the better hear thee said the governor the escribano entered the carriage when in a twinkling the door was closed the coachman smacked his whip mules carriage guards and all dashed off at a thundering rate leaving the crowd in gaping wonderment nor did the governor pause until he had lodged his prey in one of the strongest dungeons of the alhambra he then sent down a flag of truce in military style proposing a cartel or exchange of prisoners the corporal for the notary the pride of the captain-general was piqued he returned a contemptuous refusal and forthwith caused a gallows tall and strong to be erected in the centre of the plaza nueva for the execution of the corporal oh ho is that the game said governor manco he gave orders and immediately a gibbet was reared on the verge of the great beetling bastion that overlooked the plaza now said he in a message to the captain-general hang my soldier when you please but at the same time that he is swung off in the square look up to see your escribano dangling against the sky 
The captain general was inflexible. Troops were paraded in the square, the drums beat, the bell tolled. An immense multitude of amateurs gathered together to behold the execution. On the other hand, the governor paraded his garrison on the bastion, and tolled the funeral dirge of the notary from the Torre de la Campagna, or Tower of the Bell. The notary's wife pressed through the crowd with a whole progeny of little embryo escribanos at her heels, and throwing herself at the feet of the captain-general, implored him not to sacrifice the life of her husband, and the welfare of herself and her numerous little ones, to the point of pride. "'For you know the old governor too well,' said she, "'to doubt that he will put his threat in execution if you hang the soldier.' The captain-general was overpowered by her tears and lamentations, and the clamours of her callow brood. The corporal was sent up to the Alhambra, under a guard, in his gallows garb, like a hooded friar, but with head erect and a face of iron. The escribano was demanded in exchange, according to the cartel. The once bustling and self-sufficient man of the law was drawn forth from his dungeon more dead than alive. All his flippancy and conceit had evaporated. His hair, it is said, had nearly turned grey with the fright, and he had a downcast, dogged look, as if he still felt the halter round his neck. The old governor stuck his one arm akimbo, and for a moment surveyed him with an iron smile. "'Henceforth, my friend,' said he, "'moderate your zeal in hurrying others to the gallows. Be not too certain of your safety, even though you should have the law on your side. And, above all, take care how you play off your schoolcraft another time upon an old soldier." End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of The Alhambra, A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Governor Manco and the Soldier When Governor Manco, or the One-Armed, kept up a show of military state in the Alhambra, he became nettled at the reproaches continually cast upon his fortress of being a nestling place of rogues and contrabandistas. On a sudden, the old potentate determined on reform, and, setting vigorously to work, ejected whole nests of vagabonds out of the fortress and the gypsy caves with which the surrounding hills are honeycombed. He sent out soldiers also to patrol the avenues and footpaths with orders to take up all suspicious persons. One bright summer morning, a patrol consisting of the testy old corporal who had distinguished himself in the affair of the notary, a trumpeter, and two privates were seated under the garden wall of the Henrelief, beside the road which leads down from the Mountains of the Sun when they heard the tramp of a horse and a male voice singing in rough though not unmusical tones an old castilian campaigning song presently they beheld a sturdy sunburnt fellow clad in the ragged garb of a foot soldier leading a powerful arabian horse caparisoned in the ancient morisco fashion astonished at the sight of a strange soldier descending, steed in hand, from that solitary mountain, the corporal stepped forth and challenged him. "'Who goes there?' "'A friend.' "'Who and what are you?' "'A poor soldier, just from the wars, with a cracked crown and empty purse for a reward.' By this time they were enabled to view him more narrowly. He had a black patch across his forehead, which, with a grizzled beard, added to a certain daredevil cast of countenance, while a slight squint threw into the hole an occasional gleam of roguish good humour. Having answered the questions of the patrol, the soldier seemed to consider himself entitled to make others in return. 
" May I ask," said he, " what city is this which I see at the foot of the hill ?"" What city !" cried the trumpeter, " come, that s too bad ! Here s a fellow lurking about the Mountains of the Sun, and demands the name of the great city of Granada." " Granada ! Madre de Dios ! can it be possible ?"" Perhaps not," rejoined the trumpeter, " and per haps you have no idea that yonder are the towers of the Alhambra." " Son of a trumpet !" replied the stranger, " do not trifle with me. If this be indeed the Alhambra, I have some strange matters to reveal to the governor." " You will have an opportunity," said the corporal, " for we mean to take you before him." By this time the trumpeter had seized the bridle of the steed, the two privates had each secured an arm of the soldier, the corporal put himself in front, gave the word " Forward, march !" and away they marched for the Alhambra. The sight of a ragged foot soldier and a fine Arabian horse, brought in captive by the patrol, attracted the attention of all the idlers of the fortress, and of those gossip groups that generally assemble about wells and fountains at early dawn. The wheel of the cistern paused in its rotations, the slip shod servant maid stood gaping with pitcher in hand, as the corporal passed by with his prize. A motley train gradually gathered in the rear of the escort. Knowing nods and winks and conjectures passed from one to another. " It is a deserter," said one. " A contrabandista," said another. " A bandalero," said a third, until it was affirmed that a captain of a desperate band of robbers had been captured by the prowess of the corporal and his patrol. " Well, well," said the old crones one to another, " captain or not, let him get out of the grasp of old governor Manco if he can, though he is but one handed." Governor Manco was seated in one of the inner halls of the Alhambra, taking his morning s cup of chocolate in company with his confessor, a fat Franciscan friar from the neighbouring convent. A demure, dark eyed damsel of Malaga, the daughter of his housekeeper, was attending upon him. The world hinted that the damsel, who, with all her demureness, was a sly, buxom baggage, had found out a soft spot in the iron heart of the old governor, and held complete control over him ; but let that pass, the domestic affairs of these mighty potentates of the earth should not be too narrowly scrutinized. When word was brought that a suspicious stranger had been taken lurking about the fortress, and was actually in the outer court, in durance of the corporal, waiting the pleasure of his excellency, the pride and stateliness of office swelled the bosom of the governor. Giving back his chocolate cup into the hands of the demure damsel, he called for his basket-hilted sword, girded it to his side, twirled up his mustachios, took his seat in a large high-backed chair, assumed a bitter and forbidding aspect, and ordered the prisoner into his presence. The soldier was brought in, still closely pinioned by his captors, and guarded by the corporal. He maintained, however, a resolute, self-confident air, and returned the sharp, scrutinizing look of the governor with an easy squint, which by no means pleased the punctilious old potentate. " Well, culprit," said the governor, after he had regarded him for a moment in silence, what have you to say for yourself? Who are you ?" "A soldier, just from the wars, who has brought away nothing but scars and bruises." " A soldier ? Humph ! A foot soldier by your garb. I understand you have a fine Arabian horse. I presume you brought him, too, from the wars, beside your scars and bruises." " May it please your excellency, I have something strange to tell about that horse. Indeed, I have one of the most wonderful things to relate ; something, too, that concerns the security of this fortress, indeed, of all Granada. 
but it is a matter to be imparted only to your private ear, or in presence of such only as are in your confidence." The governor considered for a moment, and then directed the corporal and his men to withdraw, but to post themselves outside of the door, and be ready at call. This holy friar, said he, is my confessor, you may say anything in his presence and this damsel, nodding towards the handmaid who had loitered with an air of great curiosity, this damsel is of great secrecy and discretion, and to be trusted with anything. The soldier gave a glance between a squint and a leer at the demure handmaid. I am perfectly willing, said he, that the damsel should remain. When all the rest had withdrawn, the soldier commenced his story. He was a fluent, smooth-tongued varlet, and had a command of language above his apparent rank. "'May it please your excellency,' said he, "'I am, as I before observed, a soldier, and have seen some hard service, but my term of enlistment being expired, I was discharged not long since from the army at Valladolid, and set out on foot for my native village in Andalusia. Yesterday evening the sun went down as I was traversing a great dry plain of old Castile. Hold! cried the governor. What is this you say? Old Castile is some two or three hundred miles from this. Even so, replied the soldier coolly. I told your excellency I had strange things to relate, but not more strange than true, as your excellency will find if you will deign me a patient hearing. Proceed, culprit, said the governor, twirling up his mustachios. As the sun went down, continued the soldier, I cast my eyes about in search of some quarters for the night, but far as my sight could reach there were no signs of habitation. I saw that I should have to make my bed on the naked plain, with my knapsack for a pillow. But your excellency is an old soldier, and knows that to one who has been in the wars such a night's lodging is no great hardship. The governor nodded assent, as he drew his pocket-handkerchief out of the basket-hilt of his sword, to drive away a fly that buzzed about his nose. Well, uh, to make a long story short, continued the soldier, I trudged forward for several miles, until I came to a bridge over a deep ravine, through which ran a little thread of water, almost dried up by the summer heat. At one end of the bridge was a Moorish tower, the upper part all in ruins, but a vault in the foundations quite entire. Here, thinks I, is a good place to make a halt. So I went down to the stream, took a hearty drink, for the water was pure and sweet, and I was parched with thirst. Then, opening my wallet, I took out an onion and a few crusts, which were all my provisions, and, seating myself on a stone on the margin of the stream, began to make my supper, intending afterwards to quarter myself for the night in the vault of the tower and capital quarters they would have been for a campaigner just from the wars, as your excellency, who is an old soldier, may suppose. I have put up gladly with worse in my time, said the governor, returning his pocket-handkerchief into the hilt of his sword. While I was quietly crunching my crust, pursued the soldier, I heard something stir within the vault. I listened. It was the tramp of a horse. By and by a man came forth from a door in the foundation of the tower, close by the water's edge, leading a powerful horse by the bridle. I could not well make out what he was by the starlight. It had a suspicious look to be lurking among the ruins of a tower in that wild, solitary place. He might be a mere wayfarer like myself. He might be a contrabandista. He might be a bandolero. What of that? Thank heaven and my poverty! I had nothing to lose. So I sat still and crunched my crusts. He led his horse to the water close by where I was sitting, 
so that I had a fair opportunity of reconnoitring him. To my surprise he was dressed in a Moorish garb, with a cuirass of steel and a polished skull-cap that I distinguished by the reflection of the stars upon it. His horse, too, was harnessed in the Morisco fashion, with great shovel stirrups. He led him, as I said, to the side of the stream, into which the animal plunged his head almost to the eyes, and drank until I thought he would have burst. "'Comrade,' said I, "'your steed drinks well. It's a good sign when a horse plunges his muzzle bravely into the water.' He may well drink, said the stranger, speaking with a Moorish accent. It is a good year since he had his last draught. By Santiago, said I, that beats even the camels that I have seen in Africa. But come, you seem to be something of a soldier. Won't you sit down and take part of a soldier's fare? In fact, I felt the want of a companion in this lonely place and was willing to put up with an infidel. Besides, as your excellency well knows, a soldier is never very particular about the faith of his company, and soldiers of all countries are comrades on peaceable ground." The governor again nodded assent. Well, as I was saying, I invited him to share my supper, such as it was, for I could not do less in common hospitality. Um, I have no time to pause for meat or drink, said he. I have a long journey to make before morning. In which direction, said I? Andalusia, said he. Exactly my route, said I. So, as you won't stop and eat with me, perhaps you let me mount and ride with you. I see your horse is of a powerful frame. I'll warrant he'll carry double. Agreed, said the trooper and it would not have been civil and soldier-like to refuse, especially as I had offered to share my supper with him. So up he mounted, and up I mounted behind him. Hold fast, said he, my steed goes like the wind. Never fear me, said I, and so off we set. From a walk the horse soon passed to a trot, and from a trot to a gallop, and from a gallop to a harem-scarum scamper. It seemed as if rocks, trees, houses, everything, flew hurry-scurry behind us. "'What town is this?' said I. "'Segovia,' said he, and before the words were out of his mouth, the towers of Segovia were out of sight. We swept up the Haradarama mountains and down by the Escorial, and we skirted the walls of Madrid and we scoured away across the plains of La Mancha. In this way we went up hill and down dale, by towns and cities, all buried in deep sleep, and across mountains and plains and rivers, just glimmering in the starlight. To make a long story short, and not to fatigue your excellency, the trooper suddenly pulled up on the side of a mountain. Here we are, said he, at the end of our journey. I looked about, but could see no sign of habitation, nothing but the mouth of a cavern. While I looked, I saw multitudes of people in Moorish dresses, some on horseback, some on foot, arriving as if borne by the wind from all points of the compass, and hurrying into the mouth of the cavern like bees into a hive. Before I could ask a question, the trooper struck his long Moorish spurs into the horse's flanks, and dashed in with the throng. We passed along a steep winding way that descended into the very bowels of the mountain. As we pushed on, a light began to glimmer up, by little and little, like the first glimmerings of day, but what caused it I could not discover. It grew stronger and stronger, and enabled me to see everything around. I now noticed, as we passed along, great caverns opening to the right and left, like halls in an arsenal. In some there were shields and helmets and cuirasses and lances and scimitars hanging against the walls. 
in others there were great heaps of warlike munitions and camp equipage lying upon the ground it would have done your excellency's heart good being an old soldier to have seen such grand provision for war then in other caverns there were long rows of horsemen armed to the teeth with lances raised and banners unfurled all ready for the field but they all sat motionless in their saddles like so many statues in other halls were warriors sleeping on the ground beside their horses and foot soldiers in groups ready to fall into the ranks all were in old-fashioned moorish dresses and armour well your excellency to cut a long story short we at length entered an immense cavern or i might say palace of grotto work the walls of which seemed to be veined with gold and silver and to sparkle with diamonds and sapphires and all kinds of precious stones at the upper end sat a moorish king on a golden throne with his nobles on each side and a guard of african blacks with drawn scimitars all the crowd that continued to flock in and amounted to thousands and thousands passed one by one before his throne each paying homage as he passed some of the multitude were dressed in magnificent robes without stain or blemish and sparkling with jewels others in burnished and enamelled armour while others were in mouldered and mildewed garments and in armour all battered and dented and covered with rust i had hitherto held my tongue for your excellency well knows it is not for a soldier to ask many questions when on duty but i could keep silence no longer prithee comrade said i what is the meaning of all this this said the trooper is a great and powerful mystery know o christian that you see before you the court and army of boabdil the last king of granada what is this you tell me cried i bob deal and his court were exiled from the land hundreds of years agone and all died in africa so it is recorded in your lying chronicles replied the moor but know that bob deal and the warriors who made the last struggle for granada were all shut up in this mountain by powerful enchantment as to the king and army that marched forth from granada at the time of surrender they were a mere phantom train or spirits and demons permitted to assume those shapes to deceive the christian sovereigns and furthermore let me tell you friend that all spain is a country under the power of enchantment there is not a mountain cave not a lonely watch-tower in the plains nor ruined castle on the hills but has some spell-bound warrior sleeping from age to age within its vaults until the sins are expiated for which allah permitted the dominion to pass for a time out of the hands of the faithful once every year on the eve of st john they are released from enchantment from sunset to sunrise and permitted to repair here to pay homage to their sovereign and the crowds which you beheld swarming into the cavern are moslem warriors from their haunts in all parts of spain for my own part you saw the ruined tower of the bridge in old castile where i have now wintered and summered for many hundred years and where i must be back again by daybreak as to the battalions of horse and foot which you beheld drawn up in array in the neighbouring caverns they are the spell-bound warriors of granada it is written in the book of fate that when the enchantment is broken boabdil will descend from the mountains at the head of his army resume his throne in the alhambra and his sway of granada and gathering together the enchanted warriors from all parts of spain will reconquer the peninsula and restore it to moslem rule a and when will this happen said i allah alone knows we had hoped the day of deliverance was at hand 
but there reigns at present a vigilant governor in alhambra a staunch old soldier the same called governor manco while such a warrior holds command of the very outpost and stands ready to check the first eruption from the mountain i fear boabdil and his soldiery must be content to rest upon their arms here the governor raised himself somewhat perpendicularly adjusted his sword and uh, twirled up his mustachios to make a long story short and not to fatigue your excellency the trooper having given me this account dismounted from his steed tarry here said he and guard my steed while i go and bow the knee to boabdil so saying he strode away among the throng that pressed forward to the throne what's to be done thought i when thus left to myself shall i wait here until this infidel returns to whisk me off on his goblin steed the lord knows where or shall i make the most of my time and beat a retreat from this hobgoblin community a soldier's mind is soon made up as your excellency well knows as to the horse he belonged to an avowed enemy of the faith and the realm and was a fair prize according to the rules of war so hoisting myself from the crupper into the saddle i turned the reins struck the moorish stirrups into the sides of the steed and put him to make the best of his way out of the passage by which we had entered as we scoured by the halls where the moslem horsemen sat in motionless battalions i thought i heard the clang of armour and a hollow murmur of voices i gave the steed another taste of the stirrups and doubled my speed there was now a sound behind me like a rushing blast i heard the clatter of a thousand hoofs a countless throng overtook me i was borne along in the press and hurled forth from the mouth of the cavern while thousands of shadowy forms were swept off in every direction by the four winds of heaven in the whirl and confusion of the scene i was thrown from the saddle and fell senseless to the earth when i came to myself i was lying on the brow of a hill with the arabian steed standing beside me for in falling my arm had slipped within the bridle which i presume prevented his whisking off to old castile your excellency may easily judge of my surprise on looking round to behold hedges of aloes and indian figs and other proofs of a southern climate and see a great city below me with towers and palaces and a grand cathedral i descended the hill cautiously leading my steed for i was afraid to mount him again lest he should play me some slippery trick as i descended i met with your patrol who let me into the secret that it was granada that lay before me and that i was actually under the walls of the alhambra the fortress of the redoubted governor manco the terror of all enchanted moslems when i heard this i determined at once to seek you excellency to inform you of all that i had seen and to warn you of the perils that surround and undermine you that you may take measures in time to guard your fortress and the kingdom itself from this intestine army that lurks in the very bowels of the land and uh, pretty friend you who are a veteran campaigner and have seen so much service said the governor how would you advise me to go about to prevent this evil it is not for an humble private of the ranks said the soldier modestly to pretend to instruct a commander of your excellency's sagacity but it appears to me that your excellency might cause all the caves and entrances into the mountain to be walled up with solid mason work so that boabdil and his army might be completely corked up in their subterranean habitation if the good father too added the soldier reverently bowing to the friar and devoutly crossing himself 
would consecrate the barricades with his blessing, and put up a few crosses and relics and images of saints, I think they might withstand all the power of infidel enchantments. They doubtless would be of great avail, said the friar. The governor now placed his arm akimbo, with his hand resting on the hilt of his Toledo, fixed his eye upon the soldier, and gently wagging his head from one side to the other. So, friend, said he, then you really suppose I am to be gulled with this cock-and-bull story about enchanted mountains and enchanted moors. Hark ye, culprit, not another word. An old soldier you may be, but you'll find you have an old soldier to deal with, and one not easily out-generaled. Ho, guard there! Put this fellow in irons!" The demure handmaid would have put a word in favour of the prisoner, but the governor silenced her with a look. As they were pinioning the soldier, one of the guards felt something of bulk in his pocket, and drawing it forth found a long leathern purse that appeared to be well filled. Holding it by one corner, he turned out the contents on the table before the governor and never did freebooter's bag make more gorgeous delivery. Out tumbled rings and jewels and rosaries of pearls, and sparkling diamond crosses, and a profusion of ancient golden coins, some of which fell jingling to the floor, and rolled away to the uttermost parts of the chamber. For a time the functions of justice were suspended. There was a universal scramble after the glittering fugitives. The governor alone, who was imbued with true Spanish pride, maintained his stately decorum, though his eye betrayed a little anxiety until the last coin and jewel was restored to the sack. The friar was not so calm. His whole face glowed like a furnace and his eyes twinkled and flashed at sight of the rosaries and crosses. "'Sacrilegious wretch that thou art!' exclaimed he. "'What church or sanctuary hast thou been plundering of these sacred relics?' "'Neither one nor the other, holy father. If they be sacrilegious spoils, they must have been taken in times long past by the infidel trooper I have mentioned.' I was just going to tell His Excellency, when he interrupted me, that on taking possession of the trooper's horse I unhooked a leathern sack which hung at the saddle-bow, and which, I presume, contained the plunder of his campaignings in days of old, when the moors overran the country. Mighty well! At present you will make up your mind to take up your quarters in a chamber of the Mermillion Towers, which, though not under a magic spell, will hold you as safe as any cave of your enchanted moors. Your Excellency will do as you think proper, said the prisoner coolly. I shall be thankful to your Excellency for any accommodation in the fortress. A soldier who has been in the wars, as your Excellency well knows, is not particular about his lodgings, and provided I have a snug dungeon and regular rations, I shall manage to make myself comfortable. I would only entreat that while your Excellency is so careful about me, you would have an eye to your fortress, and think on the hint I dropped about stopping up the entrances to the mountain. Here ended the scene. The prisoner was conducted to a strong dungeon in the Vermilion Towers, the Arabian steed was led to His Excellency's stable, and the trooper's sack was deposited in His Excellency's strong-box. To the latter, it is true, the friar made some demur, questioning whether the sacred relics, which were evidently sacrilegious spoils, should not be placed in custody of the church. But as the governor was peremptory on the subject, and was absolute lord in the Alhambra, the friar discreetly dropped the discussion, but determined to convey intelligence of the fact to the church dignitaries in Granada. To explain these prompt and rigid measures on the part of old Governor Manco 
it is proper to observe that about this time the Alpuxarra mountains, in the neighbourhood of Granada, were terribly infected by a gang of robbers under the command of a daring chief named Manuel Barrasco, who were accustomed to prowl about the country, and even to enter the city in various disguises to gain intelligence of the departure of convoys of merchandise or travellers with well-lined purses, whom they took care to waylay in distant and solitary passes of their road. These repeated and daring outrages had awakened the attention of government, and the commanders of the various posts had received instructions to be on the alert and to take up all suspicious stragglers. Governor Manco was particularly zealous in consequence of the various stigmas that had been cast upon his fortress, and he now doubted not that he had entrapped some formidable desperado of this gang. In the meantime the story took wind and became the talk not merely of the fortress but of the whole city of Granada. It was said that the noted robber, Manuel Barrasco, the terror of the Alpurajas, had fallen into the clutches of old Governor Manco, and had been cooped up by him in a dungeon of the Vermilion Towers, and every one who had been robbed by him flocked to recognize the marauder. The Vermilion Towers, as is well known, stand apart from the Alhambra on a sister hill separated from the main fortress by the ravine down which passes the main avenue. There were no outer walls, but a sentinel patrolled before the tower. The window of the chamber in which the soldier was confined was strongly grated and looked upon a small esplanade. Here the good folks of Granada repaired to gaze at him as they would at a laughing hyena grinning through the cage of a menagerie. Nobody, however, recognized him for Manuel Barrasco, for that terrible robber was noted for a ferocious physiognomy, and had by no means the good-humoured squint of the prisoner. Visitors came not merely from the city, but from all parts of the country, but nobody knew him, and there began to be doubts in the minds of the common people whether there might not be some truth in his story. That Boabdil and his army were shut up in the mountain was an old tradition which many of the ancient inhabitants had heard from their fathers. Numbers went up to the Mountains of the Sun, or rather of St. Elena, in search of the cave mentioned by the soldier, and saw and peeped into the deep dark pit, descending, no one knows how far, into the mountain, and which remains there to this day, the fabled entrance to the subterranean abode of Boabdil. By degrees the soldier became popular with the common people. A freebooter of the mountains is by no means the opprobrious character in Spain that a robber is in any other country. On the contrary, he is a kind of chivalrous personage in the eyes of the lower classes. There is always a disposition, also, to cavil at the conduct of those in command, and many began to murmur at the high-handed measures of old Governor Manco, and to look upon the prisoner in the light of a martyr. The soldier, however, was a merry, waggish fellow that had a joke for every one who came near his window, and a soft speech for every female. He had procured an old guitar also and would sit by his window and sing ballads and love ditties to the delight of the women of the neighborhood who would assemble on the esplanade in the evenings and dance boleros to his music. Having trimmed off his rough beard, his sunburned face found favor in the eyes of the fair, and the demure handmaid of the governor declared that his squint was perfectly irresistible. This kind-hearted damsel had, from the first, evinced a deep sympathy in his fortunes, and having in vain tried to mollify the governor, had set to work privately to mitigate the rigor of his dispensations. Every day she brought the prisoner some crumbs of comfort which had fallen from the governor's table, 
or been abstracted from his larder, together with, now and then, a consoling bottle of choice Val de Peñas, or rich Malaga. While this petty treason was going on in the very centre of the old governor's citadel, a storm of open war was brewing up among his external foes. The circumstances of a bag of gold and jewels having been found upon the person of the supposed robber had been reported, with many exaggerations, in Granada. A question of territorial jurisdiction was immediately started by the governor's inveterate rival, the captain-general. He insisted that the prisoner had been captured without the precincts of the Alhambra and within the rules of his authority. He demanded his body, therefore, and the spoilia optima taken with him. Due information having been carried likewise by the friar to the Grand Inquisitor of the crosses and the rosaries and other relics contained in the bag, he claimed the culprit as having been guilty of sacrilege, and insisted that his plunder was due to the church and his body to the next auto de fe. The feuds ran high, the governor was furious, and swore, rather than surrender his captive, he would hang him up within the Alhambra as a spy caught within the purlieu of the fortress. The captain-general threatened to send a body of soldiers to transfer the prisoner from the Vermilion Towers to the city. The Grand Inquisitor was equally bent upon dispatching a number of the familiars of the Holy Office. Word was brought late at night to the governor of these machinations. "'Let them come!' said he. They'll find me beforehand with them. He must rise bright and early who would take in an old soldier. He accordingly issued orders to have the prisoner removed at daybreak to the Don John keep within the walls of the Alhambra. And do you hear, child, said he to his demure handmaid, tap at my door and wake me before cock crowing, that I may see to the matter myself. The day dawned, the cock crowed, but nobody tapped at the door of the governor. The sun rose high above the mountain-tops, and glittered in at his casement, ere the governor was awakened from his morning dreams by his veteran corporal, who stood before him with terror stamped upon his iron visage. "'He's off! He's gone!' cried the corporal, gasping for breath. "'Who's off? Who's gone?' The, the soldier, the robber, the, the devil, for aught I know. His dungeon is empty, but the door locked. No one knows how he has escaped out of it. Who saw him last? Your handmaid. She brought him his supper. Let her be called instantly. Here was new matter of confusion. The chamber of the demure damsel was likewise empty. Her bed had not been slept in. She had doubtless gone off with the culprit, as she had appeared for some days past to have frequent conversations with him. This was wounding the old governor in a tender part, but he had scarce time to wince at it when new misfortunes broke upon his view. On going into his cabinet he found his strong-box open, the leathern purse of the trooper extracted, and with it a couple of corpulent bags of doubloons. But how and which way had the fugitives escaped? A peasant who lived in a cottage by the roadside leading up into the Sierra declared that he had heard the tramp of a powerful steed just before daybreak passing up into the mountains. He had looked out at his casement, and could just distinguish a horseman with a female seated before him. "'Search the stables!' cried Governor Manco. The stables were searched. All the horses were in their stalls, excepting the Arabian steed. In his place was a stout cudgel tied to the manger, and on it a label bearing these words, "'A gift to Governor Manco from an old soldier. End of chapter 28 
Chapter Twenty Nine of the Alhambra: A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine: Legend of the Two Discreet Statues. There lived once in a waste apartment of the Alhambra a merry little fellow named Lope Sanchez who worked in the gardens, and was as brisk and blithe as a grasshopper, singing all day long. He was the life and soul of the fortress. When his work was over, he would sit on one of the stone benches of the esplanade, and strum his guitar, and sing long ditties about the Cid, and Bernardo del Carpio, and Fernando del Pulgar, and other Spanish heroes, for the amusement of the old soldiers of the fortress, or would strike up a merrier tune and set the girls dancing boleros and fandangos like most little men lope sanchez had a strapping buxom dame for a wife who could almost have put him in her pocket but he lacked the usual poor man's lot instead of ten children he had but one this was a little black-eyed girl about twelve years of age named sanchica who was as merry as himself and the delight of his heart she played about him as he worked in the gardens danced to his guitar as he sat in the shade and ran as wild as a young fawn about the groves and alleys and ruined halls of the alhambra it was now the eve of the blessed st john and the holy day loving gossips of the alhambra men women and children went up at night to the mountains of the sun which arises above the Henrelief, to keep their midsummer vigil on its level summit. It was a bright moonlight night, and all the mountains were grey and silvery, and the city, with its domes and spires, lay in shadows below, and the vega was like a fairyland, with haunted streams gleaming among its dusky groves. On the highest part of the mountain they lit up a bale-fire, according to an old custom of the country, handed down from the moors. The inhabitants of the surrounding country were keeping a similar vigil, and bale-fires here and there in the vega, and along the folds of the mountains, blazed up palely in the moonlight. The evening was gaily passed in dancing to the guitar of Lope Sanchez, who was never so joyous as when on a holiday revel of the kind. While the dance was going on, the little Sanchica, with some of her playmates, sported among the ruins of an old Moorish fort that crowns the mountain, when, in gathering pebbles in the fosse, she found a small hand, curiously carved of jet, the fingers closed and the thumb firmly clasped upon them. Overjoyed with her good fortune, she ran to her mother with her prize. It immediately became a subject of sage speculation, and was eyed by some with superstitious distrust. "'Throw it away,' said one. "'It is Moorish. Depend upon it, there's mischief and witchcraft in it.' "'By no means,' said another. "'You may sell it for something to the jewellers of the Zacatin." In the midst of this discussion an old tawny soldier drew near, who had served in Africa and was as swarthy as a moor. He examined the hand with a knowing look. "'I have seen things of this kind,' said he, "'among the moors of Barbary. It is of great value to guard against the evil eye, and all kinds of spells and enchantments. I give you joy, friend Lope. This bodes good luck to your child.' Upon hearing this, the wife of Lope Sanchez tied the little hand of jet to a ribbon and hung it round the neck of her daughter. The sight of this talisman called up all the favorite superstitions about the Moors. The dance was neglected, and they sat in groups on the ground, telling old legendary tales handed down from their ancestors. Some of their stories turned upon the wonders of the very mountain upon which they were seated which is a famous hobgoblin region. One ancient crone gave a long account of the subterranean palace in the bowels of that mountain, where Boabdil and all his Moslem court are said to remain enchanted. 
among yonder ruins," said she, pointing to some crumbling walls and mounds of earth on a distant part of the mountain, " there is a deep black pit, that goes down, down into the very heart of the mountain. For all the money in Granada, I would not look down into it. Once upon a time, a poor man of the Alhambra, who tended goats upon this mountain, scrambled down into that pit after a kid that had fallen in. He came out again, all wild and staring, and told such things of what he had seen that every one thought his brain was turned. He raved for a day or two about hobgoblin moors that had pursued him in the cavern, and could hardly be persuaded to drive his goats up again to the mountain. He did so at last, but, poor man, he never came down again. The neighbors found his goats browsing about the Moorish ruins, and his hat and mantle lying near the mouth of the pit, but he was never heard more of. The little Sanchica listened with breathless attention to this story. She was of a curious nature, and felt immediately a great hankering to peep into this dangerous pit. Stealing away from her companions, she sought the distant ruins, and, after groping for some time among them, came to a small hollow or basin near the brow of the mountain, where it swept steeply down into the valley of the Daro. In the centre of this basin yawned the mouth of the pit. Sanchica ventured to the verge and peeped in. All was black as pitch, and gave an idea of immeasurable depth. Her blood ran cold. She drew back, then peeped again, then would have run away, then took another peep. The very horror of the thing was delightful to her. At length she rolled a large stone and pushed it over the brink. For some time it fell in silence, then struck some rocky projection with a violent crash, then rebounded from side to side, rumbling and tumbling, with a noise like thunder, then made a final splash into water, far, far below, and all was again silent. The silence, however, did not long continue. It seemed as if something had been awakened within this dreary abyss. A murmuring sound gradually rose out of the pit like the hum and buzz of a beehive. It grew louder and louder. There was the confusion of voices as of a distant multitude, together with the faint din of arms, clash of cymbals, and clangor of trumpets, as if some army were marshalling for battle in the very bowels of the mountain. The child drew off with silent awe, and hastened back to the place where she had left her parents and their companions. All were gone. The bale-fire was expiring, and its last wreath of smoke curling up in the moonshine. The distant fires that had blazed along the mountains and in the vega were all extinguished. Everything seemed to have sunk to repose. Sanchica called her parents and some of her companions by name, but received no reply. She ran down the side of the mountain and by the gardens of the Henrelief until she arrived in the alley of trees leading to the Alhambra, where she seated herself on a bench of a woody recess to recover breath. The bell from the watch-tower of the Alhambra tolled midnight. There was a deep tranquillity, as if all nature slept, excepting the low tinkling sound of an unseen stream that ran under the covert of the bushes. The breathing sweetness of the atmosphere was lulling her to sleep, when her eye was caught by something glittering at a distance, and, to her surprise, she beheld a long cavalcade of Moorish warriors pouring down the mountain-side and along the leafy avenues. Some were armed with lances and shields, others with scimitars and battle-axes, and with polished cuirasses that flashed in the moonbeams. Their horses pranced proudly and champed upon the bit, but their tramp caused no more sound than if they had been shod with felt, and the riders were all as pale as death. Among them rode a beautiful lady with a crowned head 
and long golden locks entwined with pearls. The housings of her palfrey were of crimson velvet embroidered with gold, and swept the earth. But she rode all disconsolate, with eyes ever fixed upon the ground. Then succeeded a train of courtiers magnificently arrayed in robes and turbans of diverse colours, and amidst these, on a cream-coloured charger, rode King Boabdil el Chico, in a royal mantle covered with jewels, and a crown sparkling with diamonds. The little Sanchica knew him by his yellow beard and his resemblance to his portrait, which she had often seen in the picture gallery of the Henrelief. She gazed in wonder and admiration at this royal pageant as it passed glistening among the trees, but though she knew these monarchs and courtiers and warriors, so pale and silent, were out of the common course of nature, and things of magic or enchantment, yet she looked on with a bold heart. Such courage did she derive from the mystic talisman of the hand which was suspended about her neck. The cavalcade having passed by, she rose and followed. It continued on to the great gate of justice, which stood wide open. The old invalid sentinels on duty lay on the stone benches of the barbican, buried in profound and apparently charmed sleep, and the phantom pageant swept noiselessly by them with flaunting banner and triumphant state. Sanchica would have followed but to her surprise she beheld an opening in the earth within the barbican, leading down beneath the foundations of the tower. She entered for a little distance, and was encouraged to proceed by finding steps rudely hewn in the rock, and a vaulted passage here and there, lit up by a silver lamp, which, while it gave light, diffused likewise a grateful fragrance. Venturing on, she came at last to a great hall wrought out of the heart of the mountain, magnificently furnished in the Moorish style, and lighted up by silver and crystal lamps. Here on an ottoman sat an old man in Moorish dress, with a long white beard, nodding and dozing with a staff in his hand, which seemed ever to be slipping from his grasp while at a little distance sat a beautiful lady in ancient Spanish dress, with a coronet all sparkling with diamonds, and her hair entwined with pearls, who was softly playing on a silver lyre. The little Sanchica now recollected a story she had heard among the old people of the Alhambra concerning a Gothic princess confined in the centre of the mountain by an old Arabian magician, whom she kept bound up in magic sleep by the power of music. The lady paused with surprise at seeing a mortal in that enchanted hall. "'Is it the eve of the blessed St. John?' said she. "'It is,' replied Sanchica. "'Then for one night the magic charm is suspended. Come hither, child, and fear not. I am a Christian like thyself, though bound here by enchantment. Touch my fetters with the talisman that hangs about thy neck, and for this night I shall be free. So saying, she opened her robes and displayed a broad golden band around her waist, and a golden chain that fastened her to the ground. The child hesitated not to apply the little hand of jet to the golden band, and immediately the chain fell to the earth. At the sound the old man awoke, and began to rub his eyes, but the lady ran her fingers over the cords of the lyre, and again he fell into a slumber, and began to nod, and his staff to falter in his hand. Now, said the lady, touch his staff with the talismanic hand of jet. The child did so, and it fell from his grasp, and he sank in a deep sleep on the ottoman. The lady gently laid the silver lyre on the ottoman, leaning it against the head of the sleeping magician, then touching the cords until they vibrated in his ear. O oh, potent spirit of harmony, said she, continue thus to hold his senses in thraldom till the return of day. 
now follow me my child continued she and thou shalt behold the alhambra as it was in the days of its glory for thou hast a magic talisman that reveals all enchantments sanchica followed the lady in silence they passed up through the entrance of the cavern into the barbican of the gate of justice and thence to the plaza de las aljibas or esplanade within the fortress this was all filled with moorish soldiery horse and foot marshalled in squadrons with banners displayed there were royal guards also at the portal and rows of african blacks with drawn scimitars no one spoke a word and sanchica passed on fearlessly after her conductor her astonishment increased on entering the royal palace in which she had been reared the broad moonshine lit up all the halls and courts and gardens almost as brightly as if it were day but revealed a far different scene from that to which she was accustomed the walls of the apartments were no longer stained and rent by time instead of cobwebs they were now hung with rich silks of damascus and the gildings and arabesque paintings were restored to their original brilliancy and freshness the halls instead of being naked and unfurnished were set out with divans and ottomans of the rarest stuffs embroidered with pearls and studded with precious gems and all the fountains in the courts and gardens were playing the kitchens were again in full operation cooks were busied preparing shadowy dishes and roasting and boiling the phantoms of pullets and partridges servants were hurrying to and fro with silver dishes heaped up with dainties and arranging a delicious banquet the court of lions was thronged with guards and courtiers and alfaquis as in the old times of the moors and at the upper end in the saloon of judgment sat boabdil on his throne surrounded by his court and swaying a shadowy sceptre for the night notwithstanding all this throng and seeming bustle not a voice or footstep was to be heard nothing interrupted the midnight silence but the plashing of the fountains the little sanchica followed her conductress in mute amazement about the palace until they came to a portal opening to the vaulted passages beneath the great tower of comares on each side of the portal sat the figure of a nymph wrought out of alabaster their heads were turned aside and their regards fixed upon the same spot within the vault the enchanted lady paused and beckoned the child to her here said she is a great secret which i will reveal to thee in reward for thy faith and courage these discreet statues watch over a mighty treasure hidden in old times by a moorish king tell thy father to search the spot on which their eyes are fixed and he will find what will make him richer than any man in granada thy innocent hands alone however gifted as thou art also with a talisman can remove the treasure bid thy father use it discreetly and devote a part of it to the performance of daily masses for my deliverance from this unholy enchantment when the lady had spoken these words she led the child onward to the little garden of linderaja which is hard by the vault of the statues the moon trembled upon the waters of the solitary fountain in the centre of the garden and shed a tender light upon the orange and citron trees the beautiful lady plucked a branch of myrtle and wreathed it round the head of the child let this be a memento said she of what i have revealed to thee and a testimonial of its truth my hour is come i must return to the enchanted hall follow me not lest evil befall thee farewell remember what i have said and have masses performed for my deliverance so saying the lady entered a dark passage leading beneath the towers of comares and was no longer to be seen 
the faint crowing of a cock was now heard from the cottages below the alhambra in the valley of the daro and a pale streak of light began to appear above the eastern mountains a slight wind arose there was a sound like the rustling of dry leaves through the courts and corridors and door after door shut to with a jarring sound sanchica returned to the scenes she had so lately beheld thronged with the shadowy multitude but boabdil and his phantom court were gone the moon shone into empty halls and galleries stripped of their transient splendour stained and dilapidated by time and hung with cobwebs the bat flitted about in the uncertain light and the frog croaked from the fish-pond sanchica now made the best of her way to a remote staircase that led up to the humble apartment occupied by her family the door as usual was open for lope sanchez was too poor to need bolt or bar she crept quietly to her pallet and putting the myrtle wreath beneath her pillow soon fell asleep in the morning she related all that had befallen her to her father lope sanchez however treated the whole as a mere dream and laughed at the child for her credulity he went forth to his customary labours in the garden but had not been there long when his little daughter came running to him almost breathless father father cried she behold the myrtle wreath which the moorish lady bound round my head lope sanchez gazed with astonishment for the stalk of the myrtle was of pure gold and every leaf was a sparkling emerald being not much accustomed to precious stones he was ignorant of the real value of the wreath but he saw enough to convince him that it was something more substantial than the stuff that dreams are generally made of and that at any rate the child had dreamt to some purpose his first care was to enjoin the most absolute secrecy upon his daughter in this respect however he was secure for she had discretion far beyond her years or sex he then repaired to the vault where stood the statues of the two alabaster nymphs he remarked that their heads were turned from the portal and that the regards of each were fixed upon the same point in the interior of the building lope sanchez could not but admire this most discreet contrivance for guarding a secret he drew a line from the eyes of the statues to the point of regard made a private mark on the wall and then retired all day however the mind of lope sanchez was distracted with a thousand cares he could not help hovering within distant view of the two statues and became nervous from the dread that the golden secret might be discovered every footstep that approached the place made him tremble he would have given anything could he but turn the heads of the statues forgetting that they had looked precisely in the same direction for some hundreds of years without any person being the wiser a plague upon them he would say to himself they'll betray all did ever mortal hear of such a mode of guarding a secret then on hearing any one advance he would steal off as though his very lurking near the place would awaken suspicions then he would return cautiously and peep from a distance to see if everything was secure but the sight of the statues would again call forth his indignation ay there they stand would he say always looking and looking and looking just where they should not confound them they are just like all their sex if they have not tongues to tattle with they'll be sure to do it with their eyes at length to his relief the long anxious day drew to a close the sound of footsteps was no longer heard in the echoing halls of the alhambra the last stranger passed the threshold the great portal was barred and bolted and the bat and the frog and the hooting owl gradually resumed their nightly vocations in the deserted palace 
Lope Sanchez waited, however, until the night was far advanced, before he ventured with his little daughter to the hall of the two nymphs. He found them looking as knowingly and mysteriously as ever at the secret place of deposit. By your leaves, gentle ladies, thought Lope Sanchez, as he passed between them, I will relieve you from this charge that must have set so heavily in your minds for the last two or three centuries. He accordingly went to work at the part of the wall which he had marked, and in a little while laid open a concealed recess in which stood two great jars of porcelain. He attempted to draw them forth, but they were immovable until touched by the innocent hand of his little daughter. With her aid he dislodged them from their niche, and found to his great joy that they were filled with pieces of Moorish gold mingled with jewels and precious stones. Before daylight he managed to convey them to his chamber, and left the two guardian statues with their eyes still fixed on the vacant wall. Lope Sanchez had thus on a sudden become a rich man, but riches, as usual, brought a world of cares to which he had hitherto been a stranger. How was he to convey away his wealth with safety? How was he even to enter upon the enjoyment of it without awakening suspicion? Now, too, for the first time in his life, the dread of robbers entered into his mind. He looked with terror at the insecurity of his habitation, and went to work to barricade the doors and windows. Yet, after all his precautions, he could not sleep soundly. His usual gaiety was at an end. He had no longer a joke or a song for his neighbors, and in short became the most miserable animal in the Alhambra. His old comrades remarked this alteration, pitied him heartily, and began to desert him, thinking he must be falling into want and in danger of looking to them for assistance. Little did they suspect that his only calamity was riches. The wife of Lope Sanchez shared his anxiety, but then she had ghostly comfort. We ought before this to have mentioned that Lope, being rather a light, inconsiderate little man, his wife was accustomed in all grave matters to seek the counsel and ministry of her confessor, Fray Simon, a sturdy, broad-shouldered, blue-bearded, bullet-headed friar of the neighboring convent of San Francisco, who was, in fact, the spiritual comforter of half the good wives of the neighborhood. He was, moreover, in great esteem among diverse sisterhoods of nuns, who requited him for his ghostly services by frequent presents of those little dainties and knick-knacks manufactured in convents, such as delicate confections, sweet biscuits, and bottles of spiced cordials, found to be marvellous restoratives after fasts and vigils. Fray Simon thrived in the exercise of his functions. His oily skin glistened in the sunshine as he toiled up the hill of the Alhambra on a sultry day. Yet notwithstanding his sleek condition, the knotted rope round his waist showed the austerity of his self-discipline. The multitude doffed their caps to him as a mirror of piety, and even the dogs scented the odor of sanctity that exhaled from his garments and howled from their kennels as he passed. Such was Fray Simon, the spiritual counsellor of the comely wife of Lope Sanchez, and as the father confessor is the domestic confidant of women in humble life in Spain, he was soon made acquainted, in great secrecy, with the story of the hidden treasure. The friar opened eyes and mouth, and crossed himself a dozen times at the news. After a moment's pause, daughter of my soul, said he, know that thy husband has committed a double sin, a sin against both state and church. The treasure he has thus seized upon for himself, being found in the royal domains, belongs, of course, to the crown. But being infidel wealth, rescued as it were from the very fangs of Satan, should be devoted to the church. 
Still, however, the matter may be accommodated. Bring hither the myrtle wreath. When the good father beheld it, his eyes twinkled more than ever with admiration of the size and beauty of the emeralds. This, said he, being the first fruits of this discovery, shall be dedicated to pious purposes. I will hang it up as a votive offering before the image of San Francisco in our chapel, and will earnestly pray to him this very night that your husband be permitted to remain in quiet possession of your wealth. The good dame was delighted to make her peace with heaven at so cheap a rate, and the friar, putting the wreath under his mantle, departed with saintly steps towards his convent. When Lope Sanchez came home, his wife told him what had passed. He was excessively provoked, for he lacked his wife's devotion, and had for some time groaned in secret at the domestic visitations of the friar. "'Woman,' said he, "'what hast thou done? Thou hast put everything at hazard by thy tattling.' "'What?' cried the good woman. "'Would you forbid my disburdening my conscience to my confessor?' "'No, wife. Confess as many of your own sins as you please. But as to this money-digging, it is a sin of my own, and my conscience is very easy under the weight of it.' There was no use, however, in complaining. The secret was told, and, like water spilled on the sand, was not again to be gathered. Their only chance was that the friar would be discreet. The next day, while Lope Sanchez was abroad, there was an humble knocking at the door, and Fray Simon entered with meek and demure countenance. Daughter, said he, I have prayed earnestly to San Francisco, and he has heard my prayer. In the dead of the night the saint appeared to me in a dream but with a frowning aspect. Why, said he, dost thou pray to me to dispense with the treasure of the Gentiles, when thou seest the poverty of my chapel? Go to the house of Lope Sanchez, crave in my name a portion of the Moorish gold to furnish two candlesticks for the main altar, and let him possess the residue in peace. When the good woman heard of this vision, she crossed herself with awe, and going to the secret place where Lope had hid the treasure, she filled a great leathern purse with pieces of Moorish gold and gave it to the friar. The pious monk bestowed upon her in return benedictions enough, if paid by heaven, to enrich her race to the latest posterity. Then, slipping the purse into the sleeve of his habit, he folded his hands upon his breast and departed with an air of humble thankfulness. When Lope Sanchez heard of this second donation to the church, he had well nigh lost his senses. Unfortunate man, cried he, what will become of me? I shall be robbed by piecemeal, I shall be ruined and brought to beggary. It was with the utmost difficulty that his wife could pacify him by reminding him of the countless wealth that yet remained, and how considerate it was for San Francisco to rest contented with so very small a portion. Unluckily, Fray Simon had a number of poor relations to be provided for, not to mention some half-dozen sturdy, bullet-headed orphan children and destitute foundlings that he had taken under his care. He repeated his visits, therefore, from day to day, with salutations on behalf of St. Dominic, St. Andrew, St. James, until poor Lope was driven to despair, and found that, unless he got out of the reach of this holy friar, he should have to make peace offerings to every saint in the calendar. He determined, therefore, to pack up his remaining wealth, beat a secret retreat in the night, and make off to another part of the kingdom. Full of his project, he bought a stout mule for the purpose, and tethered it in a gloomy vault underneath the tower of the seven floors. 
the very place from whence the ballado or goblin horse without a head is said to issue forth at midnight and to scour the streets of granada pursued by a pack of hell-hounds lope sanchez had little faith in the story but availed himself of the dread occasioned by it knowing that no one would be likely to pry into the subterranean stable of the phantom steed he sent off his family in the course of the day with orders to wait for him at a distant village of the vega as the night advanced he conveyed his treasure to the vault under the tower and having loaded his mule he led it forth and cautiously descended the dusky avenue honest lope had taken his measures with the utmost secrecy imparting them to no one but the faithful wife of his bosom by some miraculous revelations however they became known to fray simon the zealous friar beheld these infidel treasures on the point of slipping for ever out of his grasp and determined to have one more dash at them for the benefit of the church and san francisco accordingly when the bells had rung for animas and all the alhambra was quiet he stole out of his convent and descending through the gate of justice concealed himself among the thickets of roses and laurels that border the great avenue here he remained counting the quarters of hours as they were sounded on the bell of the watch-tower and listening to the dreary hootings of owls and the distant barkings of dogs from the gypsy caverns at length he heard the tramp of hoofs and through the gloom of the overshadowing trees imperfectly beheld a steed descending the avenue the sturdy friar chuckled at the idea of the knowing turn he was about to serve honest lope tucking up the skirts of his habit and wriggling like a cat watching a mouse he waited until his prey was directly before him when darting forth from his leafy covert and putting one hand on the shoulder and the other on the crupper he made a vault that would not have disgraced the most experienced master of equitation and alighted well forked astride the steed aha said the sturdy friar we shall now see who best understands the game he had scarce uttered the words when the mule began to kick and rear and plunge and then set off at full speed down the hill the friar attempted to check him but in vain he bounded from rock to rock and bush to bush the friar's habit was torn to ribbons and fluttered in the wind his shaven pole received many a hard knock from the branches of the trees and many a scratch from the brambles to add to his terror and distress he found a pack of seven hounds in full cry at his heels and perceived too late that he was actually mounted upon the terrible ballado away they went according to the ancient phrase pull devil pull friar down the great avenue across the plaza nueva along the zacatin around the viva rambla never did huntsman and hound make a more furious run or more infernal uproar in vain did the friar invoke every saint in the calendar and the holy virgin into the bargain every time he mentioned a name of the kind it was like a fresh application of the spur and made the ballado bound as high as a house through the remainder of the night was the unlucky Fray Simon carried hither and thither and whither he would not, until every bone in his body ached, and he suffered a loss of leather too grievous to be mentioned. At length the crowing of a cock gave the signal of returning day. At the sound the goblin steed wheeled about and galloped back for his tower. Again he scoured the Viva Rambla, the Zacatin, the Plaza Nueva, and the Avenue of the Fountains, the seven dogs yelling and barking and leaping up and snapping at the heels of the terrified friar. The first streak of day had just appeared as they reached the tower. Here the goblin steed kicked up his heels, sent the friar a somerset through the air, 
plunged into the dark vault followed by the infernal pack, and a profound silence succeeded to the late deafening clamour. Was ever so diabolical a trick played off upon Holy Friar? A peasant going to his labours at early dawn found the unfortunate Fray Simon lying under a fig tree at the foot of the tower, but so bruised and bedevilled that he could neither speak nor move. He was conveyed with all care and tenderness to his cell, and the story went that he had been waylaid and maltreated by robbers. A day or two elapsed before he recovered the use of his limbs. He consoled himself in the meantime with the thoughts that, though the mule with the treasure had escaped him, he had previously had some rare pickings at the infidel spoils. His first care on being able to use his limbs was to search beneath his pallet, where he had secreted the myrtle wreath and the leathern pouches of gold extracted from the piety of Dame Sanchez. What was his dismay at finding the wreath in effect but a withered branch of myrtle, and the leathern pouches filled with sand and gravel? Fray Simon, with all his chagrin, had the discretion to hold his tongue, for to betray the secret might draw on him the ridicule of the public and the punishment of his superior. It was not until many years afterwards, on his deathbed, that he revealed to his confessor his nocturnal ride on the Belado. Nothing was heard of Lope Sanchez for a long time after his disappearance from the Alhambra. His memory was always cherished as that of a merry companion, though it was feared from the care and melancholy showed in his conduct shortly before his mysterious departure that poverty and distress had driven him to some extremity. Some years afterwards, one of his old companions, an invalid soldier, being at Malaga, was knocked down and nearly run over by a coach and six. The carriage stopped, an old gentleman, magnificently dressed, with a bag-wig and sword, stepped out to assist the poor invalid. What was the astonishment of the latter to behold in this grand cavalier his old friend Lope Sanchez, who was actually celebrating the marriage of his daughter Sanchica with one of the first grandees in the land. The carriage contained the bridal party. There was Dame Sanchez, now grown as round as a barrel, and dressed out with feathers and jewels, and necklaces of pearls, and necklaces of diamonds, and rings on every finger, and altogether a finery of apparel that had not been seen since the days of Queen Sheba. The little Sanchica was now grown to be a woman, and for grace and beauty might have been mistaken for a duchess, if not a princess outright. The bridegroom sat beside her, rather a withered, spindle-shanked little man, but this only proved him to be of the true blood a legitimate Spanish grandee, being rarely above three cubits in stature. The match had been of the mother's making. Riches had not spoiled the heart of honest Lope. He kept his old comrade with him for several days, feasted him like a king, took him to plays and bullfights, and at length sent him away rejoicing with a big bag of money for himself, and another to be distributed among his ancient messmates of the Alhambra. Lope always gave out that a rich brother had died in America and left him heir to a copper mine, but the shrewd gossips of the Alhambra insist that his wealth was all derived from his having discovered the secret guarded by the two marble nymphs of the Alhambra. It is remarked that these very discreet statues continue even unto the present day with their eyes fixed most significantly on the same part of the wall, which leads many to suppose there is still some hidden treasure remaining there, well worth the attention of the enterprising traveller. Though others, and particularly all female visitors, regard them with great complacency, 
as lasting monuments of the fact that women can keep a secret. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty of the Alhambra, a series of tales and sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty Mohammed Aben Alamar, the founder of the Alhambra. Having dealt so freely in the marvellous legends of the Alhambra, I feel as if bound to give the reader a few facts concerning its sober history or rather the history of those magnificent princes, its founder and finisher, to whom Europe is indebted for so beautiful and romantic an oriental monument. To attain these facts I descended from this region of fancy and fiction, where everything is liable to take an imaginative tint, and carried my researches among the dusty tomes of the old Jesuit's library in the university. This once boasted repository of erudition is now a mere shadow of its former self, having been stripped of its manuscripts and rarest works by the French, while masters of Granada. Still it contains, among many ponderous tomes of polemics of the Jesuit fathers, several curious tracts of Spanish literature, and above all a number of those antiquated, dusty, parchment-bound chronicles for which I have a peculiar veneration. In this old library I have passed many delightful hours of quiet, undisturbed literary foraging, for the keys of the doors and bookcases were kindly entrusted to me, and I was left alone to rummage at my leisure, a rare indulgence in these sanctuaries of learning, which too often tantalize the thirsty student with the sight of sealed fountains of knowledge. In the course of these visits I gleaned the following particulars concerning the historical characters in question. The Moors of Granada regarded the Alhambra as a miracle of art, and had a tradition that the king who founded it dealt in magic or at least was deeply versed in alchemy, by means of which he procured the immense sums of gold expended in its erection. A brief view of his reign will show the real secret of his wealth. The name of this monarch, as inscribed on the walls of some of the apartments, was Aben Abd Allah, i.e., the father of Abdallah, but he is commonly known in Moorish history as Muhammad Aben Alamar, or Muhammad, son of Alamar, or simply Aben Alamar, for the sake of brevity. He was born in Arjona in the year of the Hegira 591 of the Christian era, 1195, of the noble family of the Bene Nassar, or children of Nasir, and no expense was spared by his parents to fit him for the high station to which the opulence and dignity of his family entitled him. The Saracens of Spain were greatly advanced in civilization. Every principal city was a seat of learning and the arts, so that it was easy to command the most enlightened instructors for a youth of rank and fortune. Aben Alamar, when he arrived at manly years, was appointed Al-Qaeda, or governor of Arjona and Hassan, and gained great popularity by his benignity and justice. Some years afterwards, on the death of Aben Hud, the Moorish power of Spain was broken into factions, and many places declared for Mohammed Aben Alamar. Being of a sanguine spirit and lofty ambition, he seized upon the occasion, made a circuit through the country, and was everywhere received with acclamation. It was in the year 1238 that he entered Granada amidst the enthusiastic shouts of the multitude. He was proclaimed king with every demonstration of joy, and soon became the head of the Moslems in Spain, 
being the first of the illustrious line of Beni Nasar that had sat upon the throne. His reign was such as to render him a blessing to his subjects. He gave the command of his various cities to such as had distinguished themselves by valour and prudence, and who seemed most acceptable to the people. He organized a vigilant police, and established rigid rules for the administration of justice. The poor and the distressed always found ready admission to his presence, and he attended personally to their assistance and redress. He erected hospitals for the blind, the aged, and infirm, and all those incapable of labor, and visited them frequently not on set days with pomp and form, so as to give time for everything to be put in order and every abuse concealed, but suddenly and unexpectedly informing himself by actual observation and close inquiry of the treatment of the sick, and the conduct of those appointed to administer to their relief. He founded schools and colleges which he visited in the same manner, inspecting personally the instruction of the youth. He established butcheries and public ovens that the people might be furnished with wholesome provisions at just and regular prices. He introduced abundant streams of water into the city, erecting baths and fountains, and constructing aqueducts and canals to irrigate and fertilize the vega. By these means, prosperity and abundance prevailed in this beautiful city, its gates were thronged with commerce, and its warehouses filled with the luxuries and merchandise of every clime and country. While Mahmud Aben Alamar was ruling his fair domains thus wisely and prosperously, he was suddenly menaced by the horrors of war. The Christians at that time, profiting by the dismemberment of the Moslem power, were rapidly regaining their ancient territories. James the Conqueror had subjected all Valentia, and Ferdinand the Saint was carrying his victorious armies into Andalusia. The latter invested the city of Hain, and swore not to raise his camp until he had gained possession of the place. Mohammed Aben Alamar was conscious of the insufficiency of his means to carry on a war with the potent sovereign of Castile. Taking a sudden resolution, therefore, he repaired privately to the Christian camp, and made his unexpected appearance in the presence of King Ferdinand. In me, said he, you behold Mohammed, king of Granada. I confide in your good faith and put myself under your protection. Take all I possess, and receive me as your vassal. So saying, he knelt and kissed the king's hand in token of submission. King Ferdinand was touched by this instant of confiding faith, and determined not to be outdone in generosity. He raised his late rival from the earth, and embraced him as a friend, nor would he accept the wealth he offered, but received him as a vassal, leaving him sovereign of his dominions, on condition of paying a yearly tribute, attending the Cortes as one of the nobles of the empire, and serving him in war with a certain number of horsemen. It was not long after this that Mohammed was called upon for his military services to aid King Ferdinand in his famous siege of Seville. The Moorish king sallied forth with five hundred chosen horsemen of Granada, than whom none in the world knew better how to manage the steed or wield the lance. It was a melancholy and humiliating service, however, for they had to draw the sword against their brethren of the faith. Mohammed gained a melancholy distinction by his prowess in this renowned conquest, but more true honor by the humanity which he prevailed upon Ferdinand to introduce into the usages of war. When, in 1248, the famous city of Seville surrendered to the Castilian monarch, Mohammed returned sad and full of care to his dominions. He saw the gathering ills that menaced the Moslem cause, 
and uttered an ejaculation often used by him in moments of anxiety and trouble. How straitened and wretched would be our life if our hope were not so spacious and extensive. When the melancholy conqueror approached his beloved Granada, the people thronged forth to see him with impatient joy, for they loved him as a benefactor. They had erected arches of triumph in honor of his martial exploits, and wherever he passed he was hailed with acclamations as El Halib, or the Conqueror. Mohammed shook his head when he heard the appellation. Vala Halib ile Allah, exclaimed he, there is no conqueror but God. From that time forward he adopted this exclamation as a motto. He inscribed it on an oblique band across his escutcheon, and it continued to be the motto of his descendants. Mohammed had purchased peace by submission to the Christian yoke, but he knew that where the elements were so discordant and the motives for hostility so deep and ancient, it could not be secure or permanent. Acting, therefore, upon an old maxim, arm thyself in peace, and clothe thyself in summer, he improved the present interval of tranquillity by fortifying his dominions and replenishing his arsenals, and by promoting those useful arts which give wealth and real power to an empire. He gave premiums and privileges to the best artisans, improved the breed of horses and other domestic animals, encouraged husbandry, and increased the natural fertility of the soil twofold by his protection, making the lonely valleys of his kingdom to bloom like gardens. He fostered also the growth and fabrication of silk until the looms of Granada surpassed even those of Syria in the fineness and beauty of their productions. He, moreover, caused the mines of gold and silver and other metals found in the mountainous regions of his dominions to be diligently worked, and was the first king of Granada who struck money of gold and silver with his name, taking great care that the coins should be skillfully executed. It was about this time, towards the middle of the thirteenth century, and just after his return from the siege of Seville, that he commenced the splendid palace of the Alhambra, superintending the building of it in person, mingling frequently among the artists and workmen, and directing their labors. Though thus magnificent in his works, and great in his enterprises, he was simple in his person and moderate in his enjoyments. His dress was not merely void of splendor, but so plain as not to distinguish him from his subjects. His harem boasted but few beauties, and these he visited but seldom, though they were entertained with great magnificence. His wives were daughters of the principal nobles, and were treated by him as friends and rational companions. What is more, he managed to make them live as friends with one another. He passed much of his time in his gardens, especially in those of the Alhambra, which he had stored with the rarest plants and the most beautiful and aromatic flowers. Here he delighted himself in reading histories, or in causing them to be read and related to him and sometimes, in intervals of leisure, employed himself in the instruction of his three sons, for whom he had provided the most learned and virtuous masters. As he had frankly and voluntarily offered himself a tributary vassal to Ferdinand, so he always remained loyal to his word, giving him repeated proofs of fidelity and attachment. When that renowned monarch died in Seville in 1254, Mohammed Aben Alamar sent ambassadors to condole with his successor, Alonso X, and with them a gallant train of a hundred Moorish cavaliers of distinguished rank who were to attend, each bearing a lighted taper round the royal bier, during the funeral ceremonies. This grand testimonial of respect 
was repeated by the moslem monarch during the remainder of his life on each anniversary of the death of king ferdinand el santo when the hundred moorish knights repaired from granada to seville and took their stations with lighted tapers in the centre of the sumptuous cathedral round the cenotaph of the illustrious deceased mohammed aben alamar retained his faculties and vigour to an advanced age in his seventy-ninth year he took the field on horseback accompanied by the flower of his chivalry to resist an invasion of his territories as the army sallied forth from granada one of the principal adelides or guides who rode in the advance accidentally broke his lance against the arch of the gate the counsellors of the king alarmed by this circumstance which was considered an evil omen entreated him to return their supplications were in vain the king persisted and at noontide the omen say the moorish chroniclers was fatally fulfilled mohammed was suddenly struck with illness and had nearly fallen from his horse he was placed on a litter and borne back towards granada but his illness increased to such a degree that they were obliged to pitch his tent in the vega his physicians were filled with consternation not knowing what remedy to prescribe in a few hours he died vomiting blood and in violent convulsions the castilian prince don philip brother of alonzo the tenth was by his side when he expired his body was embalmed enclosed in a silver coffin and buried in the alhambra in a sepulchre of precious marble amidst the unfeigned lamentations of his subjects who bewailed him as a parent such was the enlightened patriot prince who founded the alhambra whose name remains emblazoned among its most delicate and graceful ornaments and whose memory is calculated to inspire the loftiest associations in those who tread these fading scenes of his magnificence and glory though his undertakings were vast and his expenditures immense yet his treasury was always full and this seeming contradiction gave rise to the story that he was versed in magic art and possessed of the secret for transmuting baser metals into gold those who have attended to his domestic policy as here set forth will easily understand the natural magic and simple alchemy which made his ample treasury to overflow. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of the Alhambra, A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 Yusuf Abul Hahias, the finisher of the Alhambra. Beneath the governor's apartment in the Alhambra is the royal mosque, where the Moorish monarchs performed their private devotions. Though consecrated as a Catholic chapel, it still bears traces of its Moslem origin. The Saracenic columns with their gilded capitals, and the latticed gallery for the females of the harem, may yet be seen and the escutcheons of the moorish kings are mingled on the walls with those of the castilian sovereigns in this consecrated place perished the illustrious yusuf abul hagias the high-minded prince who completed the alhambra and who for his virtues and endowments deserves almost equal renown with its magnanimous founder it is with pleasure i draw forth from the obscurity in which it has too long remained the name of another of those princes of a departed and almost forgotten race who reigned in elegance and splendour in andalusia when all europe was in comparative barbarism yusef abul hais or as it is sometimes written hahis ascended the throne of granada in the year thirteen thirty three 
and his personal appearance and mental qualities were such as to win all hearts, and to awaken anticipations of a beneficent and prosperous reign. He was of a noble presence, and great bodily strength, united to manly beauty. His complexion was exceeding fair, and, according to the Arabian chroniclers, he heightened the gravity and majesty of his appearance by suffering his beard to grow to a dignified length and dyeing it black. He had an excellent memory, well stored with science and erudition. He was of a lively genius and accounted the best poet of his time, and his manners were gentle, affable, and urbane. Yusef possessed the courage common to all generous spirits, but his genius was more calculated for peace than war, and though obliged to take up arms repeatedly in his time, he was generally unfortunate. He carried the benignity of his nature into warfare, prohibiting all wanton cruelty, and enjoining mercy and protection towards women and children, the aged and infirm, and all friars and persons of holy and recluse life. Among other ill-starred enterprises, he undertook a great campaign in conjunction with the King of Morocco against the kings of Castile and Portugal, but was defeated in the memorable Battle of Salado, a disastrous reverse which had nearly proved a death-blow to the Moslem power in Spain. Yusef obtained a long truce after this defeat, during which time he devoted himself to the instruction of his people and the improvement of their morals and manners. For this purpose he established schools in all the villages with simple and uniform systems of education. He obliged every hamlet of more than twelve houses to have a mosque and prohibited various abuses and indecorums that had been introduced into the ceremonies of religion, and the festivals and public amusements of the people. He attended vigilantly to the police of the city, establishing nocturnal guards and patrols, and superintending all municipal concerns. His attention was also directed towards finishing the great architectural works commenced by his predecessors, and erecting others on his own plans. The Alhambra, which had been founded by the good Aben Alamar, was now completed. Yusef constructed the beautiful Gate of Justice, forming the grand entrance to the fortress, which he finished in 1348. He likewise adorned many of the courts and halls of the palace, as may be seen by the inscriptions on the walls, in which his name repeatedly occurs. He built also the noble Alcazar, or citadel of Malaga, now unfortunately a mere mass of crumbling ruins, but which probably exhibited in its interior similar elegance and magnificence with the Alhambra. The genius of a sovereign stamps a character upon his time. The nobles of Granada, imitating the elegant and graceful taste of Yusef, soon filled the city of Granada with magnificent palaces, the halls of which were paved in mosaic, the walls and ceilings wrought in fretwork, and delicately gilded and painted with azure, vermilion, and other brilliant colors, or minutely inlaid with cedar and other precious woods, specimens of which have survived in all their lustre the lapse of several centuries. Many of the houses had fountains which threw up jets of water to refresh and cool the air. They had lofty towers also, of wood or stone, curiously carved and ornamented, and covered with plates of metal that glittered in the sun. Such was the refined and delicate taste in architecture that prevailed among this elegant people, insomuch that to use the beautiful simile of an Arabian writer, Granada in the days of Yusuf was as a silver vase filled with emeralds and jacinths. One anecdote will be sufficient to show the magnanimity of this generous prince. The long truce which had succeeded the Battle of Salado 
was at an end, and every effort of Jusef to renew it was in vain. His deadly foe, Alfonso XI of Castile, took the field with great force, and laid siege to Gibraltar. Yusef reluctantly took up arms, and sent troops to the relief of the place. When, in the midst of his anxiety, he received tidings that his dreaded foe had suddenly fallen a victim to the plague, instead of manifesting exultation on the occasion, Yusef called to mind the great qualities of the deceased, and was touched with a noble sorrow. Alas! cried he, the world has lost one of its most excellent princes, a sovereign who knew how to honor merit, whether in friend or foe. The Spanish chroniclers themselves bear witness to this magnanimity. According to their accounts, the Moorish cavaliers partook of the sentiment of their king, and put on mourning for the death of Alfonso. Even those of Gibraltar, who had been so closely invested, when they knew that the hostile monarch lay dead in his camp, determined among themselves that no hostile movement should be made against the Christians. The day on which the camp was broken up, and the army departed, bearing the corpse of Alfonso, the Moors issued in multitude from Gibraltar, and stood mute and melancholy, watching the mournful pageant. The same reverence for the deceased was observed by all the Moorish commanders on the frontiers, who suffered the funeral train to pass in safety, bearing the corpse of the Christian sovereign from Gibraltar to Seville. Yusef did not long survive the enemy he had so generously deplored. In the year 1354, as he was one day praying in the royal mosque of the Alhambra, a maniac rushed suddenly from behind and plunged a dagger in his side. The cries of the king brought his guards and courtiers to his assistance. They found him weltering in his blood and in convulsions. He was born to the royal apartments, but expired almost immediately. The murderer was cut to pieces, and his limbs burnt in public to gratify the fury of the populace. The body of the king was interred in a superb sepulchre of white marble. A long epitaph in letters of gold upon an azure ground recorded his virtues. Here lies a king and martyr of an illustrious line, gentle, learned, and virtuous, renowned for the graces of his person and his manners, whose clemency, piety, and benevolence were extolled throughout the kingdom of Granada. He was a great prince, an illustrious captain, a sharp sword of the Moslems, a valiant standard-bearer among the most potent monarchs, and so forth. The mosque still remains, which once resounded with the dying cries of Yusuf, but the monument which recorded his virtues has long since disappeared. His name, however, remains inscribed among the ornaments of the Alhambra, and will be perpetuated in connection with this renowned pile, which it was his pride and delight to beautify. End of chapter 31 End of the Alhambra, a series of tales and sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving